meeting of the Board of Regents of Texas Tech University System is now called to order. The Board will continue in open session to meet as a committee of the whole and meeting of the Board. Before we begin, I have some special recognitions I'd like to do. Uh, Chief Sagrist, will you raise your hand, please? Chief Sagrist is, is the Chief of our Police Department on our campus of Texas Tech, and his guys do an unbelievable job. Uh, they do anything that anyone asks of them, uh, from the regents to the presidents, you do, your guys do a remarkable job, and we're very proud of them. And, and I'd like to go through the list, and I know Mark's here, if he'll stand, and I think David's here. So uh, Mark Haney, everybody knows Mark. Uh, he drives Rick Francis around. <laughs> how, many, how many vehicles has he gone for? <laughs> I got Larry Phillips. <laughs> oh, you do? Oh, okay. Uh, Doug Holly is not here, I don't believe. Brian Gilster, Ricky Eady. Ricky's here, good. Uh, Doug Phillips, Larry Phillips, uh, John Corner, Jack Floyd, Keith Sumner, Larry Lewis, Robert Garza, Joe Rodriguez, Maureen Pear, and David Babcock. Everybody knows David. Yeah. 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 The smiling David. So we appreciate all your guys do. Uh, it's a wonderful staff, and uh, uh, we applaud you. Believe me, we applaud you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to uh, echo what you said about our, our police department. They do a, a nice job. I think they, they handle things in a very appropriate way. Uh, but uh, I know we all feel a lot safer uh, when, with their presence, and I appreciate what they do for us as well. Thank you. Uh, I suggested to the chair that we call attention to these. This past week when Paul McCartney was in town, if it weren't for David and some of the other ones, I think the chancellor might still be trying to get into his car. <laughs> and up to the suite, and David snuck a bunch of us in behind the scene to help Dr. Nellis. So thank you very much, because that was incredible service beyond the call. Chief Sigurds, thank you. Thank you, sir. Chancellor Duncan, President May, President Nellis, President Mitchell, and President Lamb, will you please do the introduction? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the board. I'd first like to uh, introduce to you Steve Bryan. Uh, and I want to celebrate Steve as uh, uh, being named as the 2014 Distinguished Risk Manager by the University Risk Management and Insurance Association. Steve is the managing director of our risk management here uh, at Texas Tech. And this is a very complex type of a job. And this is a huge honor to be named as the 2014 Distinguished Risk Manager. Oh, would you please stand up, Steve? I'd next like to introduce somebody to you that you already know, Kim Turner. Kim, as you know, I think, at least there was an announcement made uh, last week, received the Outstanding Professional Contributions, con con Contributions Award from the Association of College of University Auditors. This recognizes a member who has made outstanding contributions to the profession of internal auditing in higher education. Of course, we knew that all along. Kim, would you be recognized? I'd like to next uh, introduce to you Kay Rhodes, the Associate Vice Chancellor and Chief Information Officer. Uh, she has been named to the, uh, as a board member for EDUCAUSE. It's an association for information technology in higher education. Would you please stand, Debbie, or rather, uh, Kay. Uh, this is just another, uh, you know, outstanding employees we have in the system and that, that are your employees, and we're real proud to announce that. Uh, also, I'd like to make an announcement that uh, Joe Rollo, who was previously our vice chancellor uh, for academic affairs uh, and formerly president of Angelo State <coughs> University, has now been named the commissioner of higher education for Louisiana. So uh, we, we, we have some good people here, and that's really a great thing. Joe did a great job for us in the system at Angelo State University, and we're real proud to see uh, his advancement in his career and uh, Louisiana's gain. Uh, I have a couple of other uh, introductions. Uh, first of all, it's a birthday today. Uh, Scott Cooksey is 29 years old today. Uh, we have 
have two new employees in the in the system office generally. Uh, Debbie Martinez comes to us as an executive administrative associate associate in our office. She formerly worked at McLaurin and McDonald. Uh, uh, law firm here for 16 years, and then prior to that, she worked for O'Shea Hall, Hart, and Forkham for 11 years. Uh, she'll be the she'll be the voice of the chancellor's office when you call in. She's uh, had a lot of experience, and we look forward to working with her, Debbie. And finally, I will introduce to you Doug Hensley. Doug Hensley uh, is the will be uh, beginning on Monday. And Doug, would you stand? Doug will be the managing director for the Texas Tech University System Communications and Marketing. You may know Doug. He was uh, previously the communicate. He right now is, but uh, as of today, or probably the last day, uh, the previously the communications manager for United Supermarkets. And there, he managed internal communications to the company's 12,000 plus uh, team members and was in a management position at the Lubbock Avalanche Journal, Journal for nearly 15 years. He's also an adjunct professor at the Texas Tech in the College of uh, Media and Communications. And, uh, we're really proud to have him here. It's a real great uh, hire for, for the system. Doug. Thank you for my introduction. President May. Aye. Okay. Uh, President Nellis. Chairman, uh, board members, I'd like to introduce a Groups. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start my introductions by highlighting an honor that Texas Tech just received this past month. As students, parents, or visitors come on our campus, we can see how beautiful our campus is, how well maintained the landscaping is, and from an administrative side, how well our staff does as far as cost efficiency. At the 2014 Green Star Awards hosted by the Professional Grounds Management Society, the Texas Tech Operations Division received the National Grounds Maintenance Award. This award was given for well-maintained turf and great uses of grasses where less water is required for their upkeep. The specific categories that were judged on were turf landscape, challenges, budget, safety, and sustainable practices. In these categories, Texas Tech scored the highest in landscaping and were commended for the university's sustainability efforts. Our grounds maintenance staff work very hard every day to keep a very large campus infrastructure as beautiful as it is. And I'd like to thank Sean Childers, who's here today, our assistant vice president over operations division, and Mike Quattaro, the director of grounds maintenance, uh, for the great work that they do. We thank them for their leadership, as well as all of the people that work in grounds maintenance. So let's give them a round of applause. I also wanted to highlight the efforts taken to recruit high school and transfer students to our campus that has resulted in our continued growth. Uh, for this fall semester, we had a record enrollment, as you know, over 35,000 students, up a little over 2,000 students in one year, the third largest uh, increase in a single year since we opened our doors in 1925. I've had the privilege of traveling with our staff uh, for undergraduate missions to top scholar events, uh, to Raider road shows, as well as participate in campus visits, high school counselor events, University Day, and many other things that are associated with recruiting students to Texas Tech and I can say with no reservation that this group of employees work tirelessly for this university and continually balance the demands of increasing our numbers while working to maintain and en enhance the quality of our student body. And I'd like to thank the following people for their leadership in undergraduate admissions. Uh, Dr. Jim Burkhalter, Senior Associate Vice President for Enrollment Management is here today. Dr. Ethan Logan, Executive Director of Undergraduate Admissions. And unfortunately, Jamie uh, Hansard is uh, managing director of, she's not, it's not unfortunate she's our managing director of undergraduate admissions, <laughs> but it's unfortunate that she's in California today actually recruiting students uh, in California to come to Texas Tech University. But we appreciate the work that these people and all their staff do for Texas Tech University, and let's, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and that concludes my introduction. Thank you. President Mitchell. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I have one introduction this morning. <clears throat> we have Mr. Paul Moore. Mr. Moore, would you stand? Mr. Moore was born on August 6, 1926 in Rowena, Texas. He was raised in Copeland, just outside of Austin. Uh, he graduated from UT in 1946. Now, I will tell you that when they typed it on here, they on purpose put it in lower cases. <laughs> uh, 
after graduation from the University of Texas, uh, he went to seminary at Eden Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, and finished there in 1949. He has served churches in Austin, San Antonio, Houston, as well as Copeland, Texas, also in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Pueblo, Colorado. He was the founding pastor of a church in his hometown of Copeland, Texas. He retired to Lubbock, Texas in 1991, which brought him to us. He began volunteering at the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in 1993, and since that time he has put in more than 4,500 hours donated specifically to the Health Sciences Center. He continues to volunteer every Tuesday, and uh, in October he celebrated 50 years of marriage to his wife Annabelle, who's here with him. And he also celebrated 65 years as an ordained pastor. And on the Health Sciences Center side, we need all the help we can get. Uh, they have six children, six grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren. It's folks like this that have made us all very proud at the HSC. And in fact, with, with his uh, volunteer work, we're going to move now to have many of our employees go to volunteer status as well, <laughs> just as a show of, a show of support. But this is, this is actually the type of individual that, that consistently shows up, is always there to help, never asks for anything more, and he makes the university what it is. So Mr. Moore, we have actually a gift for you that is typically reserved for the big muckety mucks. <laughs> Notice Mitchell has to have a lot of help opening the package. <laughs> He's going to volunteer status. <laughs> <laughs> you know if I'm wearing red and black today instead of orange. <laughs> there we go. Oh, listen, Mark, if I can get it open. Shoot it, shoot it open. Jeremy is a second year medical student. He'll be our first student government representative to give a report. Who recruited him? Dr. Mitchell recruited him. Yeah. He recruited him. I'm going to graduate him. Yeah. Jeremy grew up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. He's from Arlington High School where he played football and pole vaulted. He made a brief, brief uh, trip through Austin where he majored in kinesiology and found his way to the Texas Tech University Health Science Center El Paso campus where he's a second year medical student. He is uh, due to be married, uh, New Year's Eve. Um, I was unaware of the fact that it would require a couple of days off from school. I told him we would bring it up in exec session to see if that's permissible or not. His wife-to-be is a civil litigator who lives in El Paso. So I just want to, you guys to welcome Jeremy, our first love. Welcome, Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy, for a... For a Kinesiology major, that's pretty smart to get that marriage deduction by getting married on the 31st. <laughs> Good stuff. Spoken like a banker. The board will now recess to conduct the CARD Scholarship uh, Foundation Trustees meeting and the Board of Regents committee meetings. The meeting of the Board of Regents will reconvene immediately following the last committee meeting as adjourned. Our goal this morning is to have all committee meetings and then we'll adjourn for lunch and then come back and do uh, the rest of the meeting after that. So, uh, Jim, are you doing it, or the car? The car is, the car group's going to okay. do it. Okay, okay. Chairman Steinman. Oh, excuse me. The meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Car Foundation is now called to order. The first order of business is approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the Car Foundation meeting held on August 7th, 2014? So, so moved. In a motion, is there a second? 
All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? The motion passes. Mrs. Wright, will you please present item number two, a report yes. on the Carr Scholarship Foundation budget. Yes, thank you and uh, for having me. Um, what I've presented to you today is simply an update of where we are with the Carr Foundation at Angelo State. These figures uh, reflect our draft annual financial report, which is still under review. It should not change, but could possibly. I just wanted to point that out. And something else of interest that I wanted to be sure that y'all noticed on this statement this year is we've added a new line, about three or four from the top. I have a $300 entry there of a donation. We actually had a student or an alum who came back and wanted to donate to the Carr Foundation scholarships and gratitude for what the scholarship program has done for them. Um, and then on the second, on the next slide, um, this is just our typical bar graph just to show you where we have been, where we are, and where we're projecting we will be with both scholarships and with the uh, foundation. Any questions? Hearing no questions, uh, thank you, Angie, for that report. Dr. Flores, please present item number three, a report on the Carr Scholarship Foundation plan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Board of Regents. We currently are awarding Carr Scholarship for dual credit students that are enrolled in dual credit programs on campus. Later this morning, you will hear a request on our admission policy, which will allow us to uh, offer dual credit to students off campus, off of the ASU campus. And so we will begin to use CAR funds. We will ex expand the utilization of CAR funds uh, to fund CAR dual credit students that are off campus. Very good. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Flores. Uh, hearing, hearing no questions, uh, are there any further comments? Thank you, Dr. Flores, for that report. Candace, will you please present item number four, a report on the status of the oil and gas audit for Absolutely. Regent Walker. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, coming around is the latest report from the Bank of Oklahoma, Bank of Texas oil and gas royalty audit. Um, that letter update will, in a nutshell, say a couple of things. First of all, they have hired a new staff member um, that is coming on board to help with this audit. And second, we discovered that we didn't have an executed copy of the Seminole San Andreas unit agreement. Um, so we're in the process of ordering that from the Gaines County clerk. Um, the copy that we had was an unexecuted agreement um, and that was in Mr. Carr's records that came to us. So um, we're in the process of getting that ordered and um, then they are coming back for another site visit the end of October um, for that new staff member. And we're looking at a shooting for a completion date of December 31st. So. Thank you, Candace. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, well, I appreciate that report. Um, the final item of business is announcements. Are there any announcements that anyone would like to make? If there's no further business to come before the board, do I hear a motion to adjourn the meeting of the Carr Foundation? So moved. Hear a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? The meeting of the Board of Trustees for the Carr Foundation stands adjourned, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Great. <laughs> uh, committee, Chairman Francis. Our committee is called to order. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting held on August 7, 2014. So moved. We have a motion. Who's the other one? Tim. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 It carries. Ms. Turner, would you uh, present item number one? Yes, thank you. Um, we're moving quicker than expected this morning, and Michael Molina is on his way over. He and I are doing a joint presentation. Before we start that, um, I will just mention that the State Auditor's Office is working on an audit of historically underutilized businesses, and the, the scope of their audit includes seven state agencies. One of those is Texas Tech University. Um, I expect the final report to come out in the next week or so. Um, and. Texas Tech University will be designated as substantially compliant in that audit, which is good news, um, along with four other of the universities. I'll, I'll ask quickly if anyone has 
You know what, Kim? If he's not here, the uh, audit committee will go into executive session as okay. authorized by sections 551-071 and 551-074 of the Texas Government Code. We'll meet in the mass rider room right now. We'll take Perfect. that first. Sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and get going. The board will now reconvene in open session. There are no action items to consider from executive session. Uh, Ms. Turner, will you present item number one? Yes, thank you. Um, shortly after Michael Molina came here as the vice chancellor, he called me one day and said, I'm really interested in setting up an, a, an audit program related to the construction business that we do here. And we talked through things, and um, of course, I was very supportive. So. Um, we issued an RFP. We got um, we selected two independent audit firms to do work for us. And I've talked to some of you in the past about how there's really a three-pronged approach to the financial aspects of project, you know, financial aspects of projects coming out of facilities planning and construction. One of those is the project manager, which is typically an architect or an engineer. The, uh, an, another is a person that Michael has hired, which we're going to talk about more later in just a minute, um, who scrubs every pay application on every project. And then the third prong is really this independent, the independent audit program that we have in place. We wanted to walk through um, the various aspects of financial controls of construction projects that are in place and um, give you some additional information on how those roles work. Great. Thank you, Kim. Appreciate the opportunity and thanks for having me in this morning uh, and deferring to exec for just a moment while I was, was not just, I was actually working at the office, but hey, that's okay. Uh, Tommy, can we... Can we go forward? Yeah, so when we, when we first came here, one of the challenges in the, uh, the missions that were uh, given to Michael um, and FPNC was clean up some of the processes and let us know from past to current how the operation works. And I think you guys know that for years we've been communicating about that. One of the key ones that Kim was um, very helpful in kind of implementing was this Tier 1, Tier 2 audit program. And, and this cost compliance manager was a key component to that. Uh, I'll talk about some other roles in just a moment, but what we did not have in-house, as any good business should, is a good audit mentality person watching not just pay applications and numbers versus uh, number of brick purchase versus number of brick in the field. That's an oversimplification a little bit, but you kind of catch my drift there. But really about how do our pay apps and data being reported from our general contractor and architectural engineering community, how are those, how are those resolved? and they need to be cross-checked back to a contract basis, not just what's in the field. So really, it was great help from rewriting every contract with our general counsel, working with Kim as part of our process and cost compliance audit management program. I won't go through every line item, but basically our CCM, or cost compliance manager, ensures the invoices are accurate when they come in. You'd be surprised how many are not. Uh, GC sides, uh, side of the equation sometimes don't add numbers right, so we verify that. And then compare that specifically to the work in the field or the work allowed in terms of materials stored to date, meaning product not in the field, but purchased and stored ready to go into that construction process. So all that's reviewed by a gentleman named Chris Cobra, who's here today. And then all that reporting rolls up to Michael and Kim at the same time, so there's no gap in missing something from both perspectives. Um, Kim, you want to continue rolling yep, through all roles? Let's go to the next one, Tommy. An important, one of the important aspects of Chris's job, he takes every contract and he actually lays it out. What are all the financial requirements, prohibitions, allowances, et cetera, with regard to this? And he uses that matrix as every pay application comes in. He's comparing it back to the tenants of the contract. So, um, and, and one point about that, when we, when we actually, before we sign a contract with any partner, we go through that exactly what is in your fee, what is not in your fee. I, I would say over the history of this, the country, uh, we're in, a, in an association of university architects, the key issue is what are, what are people maybe dumping into a project that really aren't related to the project or really not related to cost of work. We'll just stop there, but you have to have some oversight in that regard, and that's one of Chris's key roles. So what does the project manager do? So Chris is watching that on a, on a contract basis and a uh, billable basis and a, an invoice basis. But our PM really is about monitoring subcontractor bid certifications, meaning we partner cor correctly, not just at a GC level, but all the way down to uh, 
every trade in the building. Ensure specified services are rendered. Uh, and then watching with our inspector the field work versus the billable work that's have coming through through Chris. And uh, the hours in the field are countless when it comes to our PM inspector role. We're, these are the team, this is the team that are, pouring, that are there for oversight on concrete placement, steel placement at four in the morning, uh, all the way through a normal work day. So uh, they, they by far are important to keep our contractors in the field on mark but also for our quality assurance and risk programs that Mr. Breedlove kind of manages for us in the field. Tom? So the Senior Director of Project Administration, we really changed that up. Uh, I think in the past, every PM reported directly to the Vice Chancellor, and we had a whole lot of challenges in terms of scheduling and moving the ball quickly, uh, i.e. delivering on time. And what we do today is have a person dedicated to uh, project administration, which is the project management core of our, of our business and basically specific to cost controls and roles. It's, they review every invoice over $10,000 and they're the liaison between FPNC and all of our contractor, subcontractor basis to resolve audit issues. And then I'm, um, and my role really is to um, specific to cost control issue final sign off. So I sign every final pay app or retainage release from uh, today. And then obviously we conduct bi-weekly meetings to make sure we're on track and know what's going on with the entire team in terms of the audit process, not only on a tier one basis, but also on a tier two basis. One more. So then we have the independent auditor, which Kim and I work together to um, develop probably some of the strongest relationships uh, with companies in the country that do this. They're not just auditors, they're contract and design management auditors. These people, that's what they do for a living. Um, this third party partner, uh, they're not internal, conducts a full in-depth contractual assessment. What, what it really does, it takes, we're auditing the receiving end of invoicing, they're auditing the books of our partners, data we never see, and it's very normal for us not to see that. They don't submit all that. They actually get in the job cost ledger of every single project on every single subcontractor of every single, every single trade within their, within their office and uh, we have a full in-depth, before we sign a contract with anybody, they have to commit to be able to do that and understand what that process is. Kim, any thoughts on this specific role These, from your um, perspective? Like Michael said, the, the two audit firms that we hired, McGladry and CBiz, um, the partners are actually doing work on our engagement. They're not just signing off at the end. Um, each of those partners um, at the respective firms has 30 plus years of construction audit experience. And their staff members that that do field work also have a significant number. One of them has more than 30 years and the other one probably has about 15 or 20 of construction audit experience. And so they're actually obtaining the general ledger of the construction management firms and going through that and scrubbing it against what we've been billed. And so, you know, this really this, this pronged approach means every person has a different vantage point. Um, the internal cost control manager in FPNC has the contract and has scrubbed that for how, what fees and what do fees cover, what are they not, um, what's being billed for and what's not. So, and he has a financial background. Um, the, the project managers and the inspectors and Michael um, and the senior director, they're architects and engineers. So they will be able to tell, well, did we, if we were supposed to get 10 beams in this building, would, did we really get 10? Or if we were supposed to have X quality of materials, is that the quality that we actually got? Which the financial people wouldn't know the difference between expensive roof tile and cheap roof tile. And then you have the independent auditors who are really scrubbing everything um, on the back end. And these independent audits also don't just happen at the end of a construction project. We actually have them do two and sometimes three phases. Sometimes we have them on the front end reviewing the contract to see if they see any um, issues with you know, what, what the contract language says. Then they do an audit at the midpoint, at the, about the halfway mark of a construction project um, so that we can nip any issues in the bud and then they do a closeout audit at the very end. You know, one, one great example on the field application, which sometimes sounds so easy, uh, we've had a contractor, not recently, but about two years ago, um, supply sprinkler pipes to a, a facility. And we're talking thousands of lineal feet of sprinkler pipe. Sprinkler pipe. When it got there, our inspectors and project management team inspect that. It sounds like a simple process, but basically found out that this was substandard pipe, not only below spec, it wasn't even close to spec, made in a country that 
shouldn't be making pipe. And uh, so we rejected it, kicked it off, and solved a lot of issues potentially down the road in five years with pipe bursts and those kind of things. So that's, that's kind of the value um, of our inspection and PM team. And so here's our report card. Um, so far, we have, um, auditors have completed audits on four projects. We have another three or four that are in progress right now. Um, and you can see that if you, if you look at tier one, um, that role was new um, um, with Talkington. And then you can see through petroleum engineering. Um, and then tier two audit, that, that refers to the independent audit firms that we have doing work. And so you can see that um, found and recovered total um, about 2.8 uh, million-ish. Um, and then the cost, costs are how much did we pay these, inter these independent audit firms? Total payments to the audit firms, 233,000. And so that makes an ROI of 2.6 million, which is 1,026%. So we, we're happy if we get an ROI, you know, if I got a 20% ROI on all my investments, I'd be sitting pretty. This is over a 1,000% ROI. So they're really paying for themselves about tenfold at this point. Um, so this has definitely been a good, a good change, a good process, and um, one that we're going to continue uh, with going forward. One, one final comment on the tier one, that's that internal audit process. Uh, these are the finalized, really, when you, when you go through and, and calculate everything that we're working on today, not everything goes to a tier two because the scale of the job is not there. Um, it's actually about a million fifty-eight thousand dollars in, I would call it cost avoidance, things that didn't slip through that might have slipped through in the past. And that's not on this record, but I can get that to you if you so choose. Michael, what's our project size before we deploy this technique? Are we doing it on all projects or? Every single project that you guys approve, I'll talk to Kim and say, uh, you know, sometimes projects are so tight on budget, um, maybe a $5 million project doesn't really need to go to a full tier two audit. But basically anything over 10 million for sure, we're okay. auditing full scale. Anything below that, I talk to Kim, here's my thoughts, uh, what do you think? Uh, here's our budget constraints. Sometimes we're fighting for down to the $10,000 to finish a roof or finish the scope for a user. So we, we discuss every one of those collaboratively. And we're paying, when we go to tier two, are we paying that out of it's, our budget? It's coming out of the project, project budget, budget, not out of budget. another budget. Right. Correct. Project budget. Well, certainly, I think we all commend you for yeah. setting this up. Uh, it came out of the aftermath of the Plaza Verde thing. Yeah. And, and, if I'm not mistaken, we've created a hell of a receivable. We haven't actually got any hard dollars yet, okay? We've, uh, we've recovered over a million. On oh, we have, support, okay. So uh, ha has, have we recovered on the Plaza Verde yet, or is that still in uh, the Plaza litigation? Verde, yes, sir. That one is, that, talking the talking head is the one still uh, talking that we have not up in the area. Right, so Lee Lewis paid us? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. That's good. Are we able to compare what yeah, other systems do, how they... Uh, approach this. Do they have the same type of system in place as policy on their facilities? I can speak from the audit side. Um, yes, most of the other systems in Texas and outside of Texas, many of them have a construction audit process like this. I know U University of Houston, I spoke with their chief auditor just recently about it, and they, they have a hard dollar amount and they audit every project above that amount through their independent auditors. UT system has independent auditors. I think A&M does, but yeah, it's very common because the ROI is so high. I mean, you, you, you can always find something. The construction business is very complex and there are a lot of opportunities for uh, not billing in accordance with contracts. All right, any other questions? Then thank you all very much. Uh, this concludes the meeting of the Audit Committee. Thank you, Chairman Francis. Chairman Monfort, facilities. Thank you, sir. Uh, the committee is called to order, and I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting held on August 7th, 2014. Second. Um, any comments? Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Aye. Uh, Michael, if you'll begin with uh, item number one. <laughs> Man. Waiting for the monitor okay. to come up. Back with the construction, the Southwest Conference thing is 
Is that what's going on over there? It Circle? is. Yes, it is. And just for your knowledge, I have been sending Mr. Turner and some Thank other you. folks pictures of Thank that, that. Uh, <laughs> progress on a weekly basis. I saw them yesterday. I yeah. thought that's what they were doing, working out there. So we appreciate you doing that. Our goal is uh, for homecoming to, for that to be a celebration area. So Good. it should look pretty sharp. Okay, item one is um, approve a budget to increase phase one abatement interior demolition of the Engineering Materials Research Center building. Uh, that's the facility, as many of us know, the old uh, Mass Comm building, which is right there in the yellow circle with the red arrow, right uh, adjacent to the uh, memorial circle. So this scope of work will include full asbestos abatement and demolition associated with the building's proposed renovation. So just a quick point of note, you did, you did approve some dollars, a little over a million dollars, or $1.6 million, uh, which was about for the design of this facility been working with the College of Engineering the President Dean Sacco and his team. So that process is in progress and moving today. What, uh, what this is, a, this is really a positioning facility for, positioning this facility for a future approval potentially in March to renovate the rest of the building. But in order to do that, we need to clean it up from an asbestos abatement and demolition perspective. Um, so the previously approved budget in the first column, the 1.68, You've seen that before. What we're adding to, to that budget is a $1.225 million uh, request so that we can proceed and start construction in October, so just in a couple weeks, and finish in March. So what that does, it makes the building clean. And the challenge with this age of building is um, not a, it's not just a little of asbestos, it's roof all the way down to floor tile. So it's a massive undertaking to happen over the next four or five months. So this is a positioning for a future project. So our recommendation today is to authorize uh, to proceed with this phase one as described. Uh, the budget increase will be funded with HE funds cash and the total project budget includes the previously approved stage one design budget of 1.68, which did include $486,160 of cash. That is our recommendation on the table today. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Michael, if you'll continue with uh, item number two. Okay, item two is uh, approve a project to construct an addition to the Rawls College of Business building. This is the new ARCOBA as we refer to it. Before I dive too deep, I'd like to call Dr. Nail up and uh, Dr. Nellis to maybe say a few words about the strategic purpose and uh, how we got to this point. of the expansion of the Rawls College of Business uh, building complex. This, uh, this building, uh, the addition that's being proposed, uh, really is consistent with what was the original plan for the Rawls College. Uh, when the <coughs> budgeting came in for the current structure, they had to scale back, and uh, some of the key facilities uh, were uh, eliminated. Um, this building expansion is consistent with their goals to bring greater national recognition to the college. It adds some uh, critical pedag pedagogical laboratory facilities that are not currently in existence in the, uh, the current Rawls College, uh, very, very important additions. And uh, this also has uh, the full support from our student leadership as part of the Rawls College. And certainly the dean is uh, uh, endorsing this as well. So I'll turn it over to our dean, Lance Nail. Thank you, President Nellis, and thank you all for entertaining our proposal this morning. Um, I think President Nellis pretty well summed up uh, our position, but uh, what we are seeking to uh, in the expansion is to go back to the original building design that we weren't able to implement. Um, we have undertaken a new strategic plan within the college, and part of that is a, a growth strategy. And what you hopefully have in front of you is a, a little bit of a fact sheet to make the business case uh, for why we're seeking this. Uh, part of what we're trying to stress is higher growth of both quantity and quality of students. We made a concentrated effort uh, to recruit more <coughs> high ability freshmen this past year, implemented that in the strategic plan. The good news is it's been very successful. Freshman enrollment's up over 20% this year in the Rawls College of Business. The bad news is, is when they become juniors and seniors taking classes, we're not going to have classroom space available for them uh, where we stand right now. Uh, and also at the graduate level, we're making a big push um, for graduate enrollment. And we've had uh, 
about a 10% growth there. So what we're seeing is that we're going to, most of our students take maybe one to two classes in their freshman and sophomore years as undergraduates, and then they're gonna take primarily all of their courses in the building. Currently, we're over 70% utilization within the building. If current projections hold up with enrollment trends, we'll be up uh, closer to 90% utilization in our building versus a, a standard of 65%. What President Nellis also mentioned, some of the things that we had to cut out of the original building, a student success center, uh, offices for our student organizations, a computerized testing center. These are facilities that we feel that we need to move up to the next level to compete with our peers, and this is what we would also include in this wing. So with that, I would just I'll keep my comments brief. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Lance, could, excuse me, if we approve this additional expansion, that will this cover the needs of the business school, and if so, for how long? Is that, I know that's a loaded question. Is that a, are we yet again putting a, a short, yeah. I mean, seriously, are we putting a short-term fix here on something that's a much long, longer-term problem? Well, I don't think we'll see 20% growth. Uh, I think that was the big pop. I think we would like to get to more of a sustainable growth within the university pattern, which is probably more like 5%. Our utilization numbers that we calculated, if we leveled off at about a 5% growth at the undergraduate and graduate level, this would take us through about 2020 without any needs at all, and hopefully more like 2025, uh, keeping utiliza <coughs> excuse me, utilization rates around 75%. That's five Steve, let, let me begin by thanking you for your leadership. You've done a tremendous job at the college, and um, as Dr. Nellis and I have spoke uh, recently about you have uh, obviously done the work that's needed to be done in order to get us where we need to be that being said um, I have some concerns and some questions regarding this I'm going to support your position personally because of the fact that you took the time to meet with the students and do that however I want to say to the my fellow board members I think this is a terrible precedence to be starting uh, a number of years ago we we had a dean that set out to raise $40 million to build the original design that we weren't able to implement. And because we were unable to raise the money that the dean committed to raising, we are now going back to the students in the form of a fee to finish the design of this building. And um, I, I predict that this will not be the first, that this may be the first time, but I don't predict it'll be the last time that we go to the students on their backs in the terms of a fee. To the students that are here today that are serving, thank you for your service. I do think it's an unfair question or request to be asked to say, we'll build you a pool today, children, but your little brother and sister or grandchildren are going to pay for the dues. So a continuation, although I understand and respect and appreciate where you're coming from, I don't think it's a fair request to ask of the students. So to you, Dr. Nellis, I would ask that you please cautiously and carefully look at when other fees come. And Chancellor, I hope you will manage that going forward. So again, I appreciate your leadership. I did want to say that I, I as a recent graduate uh, 15, 13 years ago, I, and a former student government president, I know what it's like to have to manage the fees, and I appreciate what the students did. So with that, I'll close my. I'm a recent MBA grad, and so I know exactly the quality of the education you get in the business department. There's no question, it's top tier. But at the same time, I think our business department ought to be the leaders on campus for finding innovative ways to do projects like this without burdening the student group. And, and I would just kind of echo Regent Steinmetz, and then we've got to find ways to do this without adding to the burden the students are to the A couple of questions. Uh, you uh, preface some of your remarks about increasing the quality of students, and with a 20% increase, did you increase the quality of students, if you could elaborate on that? And secondly, with this kind of growth, do you have the faculty to be able to produce a top quality product? Now, I think that this is something that, that, that we'll ask uh, anyone that's growing rapidly. Absolutely. Uh, very valid questions, and these are the questions our own faculty have been asking as we've made this push. We're happy to say that, yes, we did increase quality and quantity. Uh, freshman enrollment, as you're 
probably aware with assured admission, you can only be admitted as a freshman if you're in the top 10% of your class or if you meet the, the 25 ACT requirement. These are assured admissions on freshmen. So uh, we've increased from 723 in the class to 869 this past year. So that's assured admissions at the freshman level. So yes, we did increase the quality. We were very pleased. Part of that was a push where we had been a little bit more passive in the college than we should have been. We just sort of accepted our students and we got great students and we were very fortunate to get great students. But now we're actually making a concerted effort. We have a full-time uh, recruiter and he's going out to the high schools and going and selling the praises of Texas Tech. And that has been a tremendous positive impact for us. Uh, and so, yes, we are seeing a rise in the quality. At the graduate level, we've seen a tremendous rise in the quality. We basically, and I'll be very uh, honest with you, we shut down admissions for a whole semester until we got the admissions where we felt that they should be so that we felt that the quality of a Texas Tech degree is where it should be. And we feel it is now. We want to continue to increase that quality. So quality will always be our number one barometer over quantity. That's, that's going to be what we stand by. From the faculty side, President Nellis and Provost Skuvenek have been very supportive in, in adding additional faculty lines. We will have to have more faculty lines with that sort of growth. We're able to manage it. We're a business. We're adaptable. We know how to do it. But you don't want to strain the educational quality and outcomes that are received. So, But we have had a lot of support from central administration for this growth, and we feel that that will continue. Could, could you also explain uh, uh, your your college received a number three rating nationally uh, recently. Could could you just you want me to brag? Like I can brag. It's not a problem, Christian <laughs> Walker. We can no, brag. It's, it's worth bragging about. We we were very pleased. Part of what we did when we came in and implemented the strategic plan, we were not pleased with what we were seeing in our graduate school and especially in our MBA program. We felt that the quality was a bit lacking. So we increased the admission standards. We added more rigor to the program. And after we did that, we found that we actually went from being an unranked program to being ranked the, the number three program in the country for quality for the degree. So uh, going back to what Regent Steinmetz said earlier, the bang for the buck of our MBA program was ranked number three in the country. So we feel that, we, we feel that our faculty did a very good job in, in overhauling that program. about, based on what you've heard this morning, what the reaction of the student body is that, uh, that are currently in the business school, what the, the, if this moves forward with this proposal to continue the student services fee, what the reaction of the students were. What, what, give us some feedback on that. Sure, I can give you a summary, and fortunately several of our students volunteer to be here. If, if you want to hear from them directly instead of me summarizing, I'd be happy to, to turn over the podium. I would say we met with 36 student leaders, both uh, leaders of student organizations within the Rawls College and our SGA reps as well. So it was about 42 or 43 students total we met with. We presented the case. On average, the, uh, an undergraduate student who matriculates through the program will pay about $1,200 in additional fees over the course of their four-year degree. MBA students or graduate students, about $600 in, in additional fees as a result of continuing this fee. We presented that case to the students and said this is going to be the cost. We think that this is what we need to do to take the college to the next level. We explained what we would do in the expansion and we asked for their feedback. The feedback, I'd say there were two components of this and this is what makes me really proud of our Rawls College students and Texas Tech students. Unanimously, there was no opposition to the fee after we presented the case. But what came out of it was even better were so many good ideas for the expansion and for things that we can do to improve our current facility. We found out there were some things that we as faculty maybe lost sight of. Uh, classroom design, that was one of the things we hadn't really heard, that classroom design is very important. Sight lines, things we hadn't thought about. Students sitting more than three rows back have difficulty seeing their professor. These are things we wouldn't really have thought about so much, but the feedback of the students helped orient our thinking for what we need to do in our current building and also what we need to do in the future. And so again, uh, they are here to, they are, they're, they've not been coached. They're here to offer their, their comments if, uh, if you have any of them. This is the only way to fund this project? 
I would think so um, for two reasons. Number one, there's already been a bricks and mortar campaign for this particular building. Going back for a second round is generally not well received by, uh, by the donor base. Secondly, and this is something actually Chancellor Duncan uh, has mentioned before, if Texas Tech as a university wants to move into that top tier, we've got to break through on the endowment levels. I think private giving has to go into endowments at this university. I think private, if, if we're going to move it to the next level, endowment giving has to go up. That's where we're lacking versus some of our peers. We spend more on bricks and mortars, bricks and mortar from giving probably than most of our peers do, most of the other deans I've talked to. So from that perspective, I do think it is, yes, in this situation especially. Dwayne, have you got any comments on this? No, I'm just, again, very supportive. I, I did meet with the uh, student government leadership, Hayden Hatch and his team, and actually Pradeep Atalari is here, but he's also a business a master's graduate student. But um, they're very supportive, in the, especially in the context of that the business student leadership is supportive. So they're endorsing it in that context, I think. This type of fee is very common, and it's what we're competing with nationally. Uh, and even with this fee, uh, we're among the lowest in the nation as far as our total cost for a business degree. In fact, if you look within the Big 12 and you add in even A&M and some of the other uh, major uh, state universities, the only one that was below us was West Virginia University. Uh, so that gives you a context of where we're at. Well, now, when you say the fees are common, the, the differential tuition fees are common, but not so often connected to infrastructure, correct? correct. No, that's, a, that's an excellent point, Regent Steinmetz, that, it, it, that what's common is a, is a differential fee for business majors, engineering majors, some of the professional schools. Right. And I know we've had discussions about that, and Regent Anders has asked us to do an analysis of that, which we're in the process of yeah. doing right now. Well, again, I see you as the mechanic. You're fixing the problem that came along, and I commend you for it. Lot of good points with regards to policy and one of that is that building buildings or extensions renovations anything using a student fee based metric um, we don't do this anywhere else and this is not our intention is to go from college to college and have that be an opportunity um, for deans to say I, I need an extension or I need a new building well let's just see if the students want to impose a fee that really lasts not only their lifetime but as Regent Steinmetz has pointed out it's binding future generations so uh, uh, while I applaud that this is a way to fix this problem it's really not the policy that we want to stay in play with regards to building facilities that we would hope that um, any type of student fee, um, we're going to be using it for something besides infrastructure. Um, so I, I just say, make that statement to make sure that there's, I don't want to open up this avenue that we're going to start building buildings or continuing this and student fees are going to be on the table for one of the options for funding. Well Very well said. Well um, are there, is there any other discussion on this item? I need to finish. I oh, I'm sorry. Fly through the tactical okay. side real quick. Uh, sorry. That's okay. I want to make sure you understand the scale and scope of the project. Um, it's about 30 to 38,000 square feet. That sounds a little odd. We normally don't have that big a range. The purpose of that, the original plan, I'll show you in a moment, uh, that was done many years There's ago. With, you know. Yeah, with, with phase one was um, this was actually planned in at 38,000 square feet. We have had a a uh, very good discussion about budgeting and Mr. Brungis and the Chancellor and Dean Nail and Dr. Nellis had input on really setting a cap so it's a little bit of a ch uh, unique approach and we're saying basically it's a 15 million dollar cap build all you can uh, and we we need to go through the programming process so we're going to fall somewhere between that range depending on the market commodity pricing on materials and labor uh, or commodity on materials and then the labor costs so that's why there's a range on this one and it's to house the things that he just talked about. Uh, there will be some surface parking modifications and utility connect into the tunnel, as well as landscape enhancement and public art will be included in this project. 
The red zone is basically what, uh, this is an actual Google map of COBA, our COBA. So the red uh, box off the left, the, the L-shaped, is the projected new facility. Uh, when you go back to the 2008 plans uh, on the proposed addition, the area in color was what was developed. Those as well as these two, so first, second, and third floor. So we're looking at a three-story solution. And as Dr. Nail said, there's some programming that we need to get back with uh, leadership within Rawls College of Business and his team, as well as the students, to make sure that this satisfies the needs of the fun and functions of their, of their uh, program. So my point is it's not going to look exactly like this floor plan done in 2008, but we will be modifying that somewhat. The budget right now is at $15 million, as I described, and um, it breaks down as shown on the screen. It's about a $10.5 million line item construction spend. Our goal is to start construction in the spring of 2015. We have some pretty uh, aggressive planning to get done before the spring and then uh, turn that back over to the institution in the summer of 2016. So our recommendation today is to authorize to proceed with this initiative. It'll be funded through the RFS system and re repaid with the Rawls College of Business facility fee, as y'all discussed. The project budget does already include uh, 300,000 of cash, which we did some pre-planning with, and have not, we've only, we haven't expended even a third of that so far. So um, that's the recommendation on the table, ma'am. Any questions? Mr. Brunges, how long will the continuation of this fee go out? <laughs> To but they're reserving to make those dog ears. So it'll be more like 2090. <laughs> We're so happy. To have Stick to medicine, <laughs> Mitchell. <laughs> Stick to medicine. <laughs> Just saying, who's <laughs> wait? <laughs> Stick to medical, Ted. <laughs> Uh, are there any other questions with regards to this item? Uh, if none, uh, is there a motion to approve? Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? If none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I do think rather than dog ears, we need a dog muscle. <laughs> Michael, if you'll please continue with item number three. Item three is to approve cancellation of a project to renovate a facility. Um, this is really just a cleanup item. Uh, many moons ago, in uh, 20, August of 2010, there were some funds dedicated to locate the Maddox chairs in the ESC building. Two-thirds of that does not exist today anymore. It's where the natatorium in the center building was. The gym still stayed. This is just a walkthrough of the 2-9 start and then opportunities to spend that and it, we really chose other or the university chose other funding sources for these other projects listed and this thing is just kind of floated through there is a policy in play with the Board of Regents that basically says any uh, initiative that has not been acted upon within 18 months which we've exceeded that uh, we need to bring that back to the board and either clarify why or cancel it so we're requesting just to clean this up and cancel this. The recommendation at the end of the day is to, uh, to authorize uh, our office to basically cancel the project to renovate the facility for the Donovan Maddox Distinguished Engineering Chairs. It doesn't mean we're not going to do that at some point. That is part of another initiative. And then return this fund balance to the allocation or to the HEAF, to HEAF of uh, we've spent about $4,689.82 of that to the source and then release the authority to use the RFS system uh, in the, to the tune of $2.7 million. So that is really a cleanup item. So moved. Second. All right. Um, I'd like to know, is this the first time we've given a refund? I, I think it's, it's the first time, yes, on my, in my For a uh, fund, so thank you very much. Okay. Um, occasionally that happens. Um, so there's been a motion and second. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Motion carries. Michael, if you will continue. Item four is under Mr. Brundus's purview, so I'll hand that over at this point. to look at sort of our facility growth over the next five years and our financing plan for that. Uh, we have met as a group with Dr. Nellis and discussed projects that we see on the planning horizon and also to reflect back a little bit on 
where we have come from over the past five years. This gives a perspective, both looking back five years and looking forward five years. I think this is important to note that this uh, study that we've done, uh, report that I'm giving today, it's important to, to take this in context that this is something that should be an ongoing every annual report and not just five years here and then five years there. So it should be something that we look at every year about the last five years going forward. Today on page two, we'll talk about the funding history of the last five years, the projects that are awaiting bond debt financing, talk a little bit about our, how our financing system works, talk about the new projects planned for the next five years, uh, talk about our credit profile, talk about future debt, and then finally talk a little bit about housing since that's uh, been on the radar screen recently. The funding history for the last five years for capital projects, I have to thank Mr. Molina and his group for compiling this. Uh, this, this chart on page four <clears throat> reflects the fact that in the last five years we've added total gross square footage for Texas Tech University of $1.5 million. Uh, our enrollment at Texas Tech University has gone up about 17% over that same time frame. The chart is divided into uh, two major sections. The first is by function. Uh, each of the projects was identified, whether it was an ENG project, athletic project, auxiliary project, or research project. Uh, you'll see there that we've done 15 ENG projects, 10 athletic, and five auxiliary projects. Then in the, in the uh, uh, block on the right, you'll see where, where did we get the money for these projects. Uh, the orange block reflects donor cash gifts, Cash is balances that came uh, from existing university funds. Heath cash is a di identification of Heath funds that were, uh, that were available. And then in blue there is bond debt or, long, or, or debt financing. Uh, you'll see there that we have five sources, so, uh, student fees, revenues, Heath, we've used Heath financing on a very short term, really to look at life safety issues at TTU. Some TRV money uh, that was left over and gifts are, are there. These are the project uh, budgets and what they were uh, allocated or set at the beginning of the project as approved by the board. You'll notice that they total approximately $400 million. On page five, uh, the projects that have been completed include a substantial portion of E and G, a little bit over 40% going to E and G, housing and dining, two major res halls, uh, the Talkington Res Hall in the West Village. Auxiliary has a small slice. Athletics projects have totaled about $92 million. Turning to page six, you'll note there that uh, that the projects that have been undertaken and completed at the HSC, ASU, and for the tech system. At the HSC, there were some re residual TRB money uh, authorized from the TRB uh, authorization in 2000 and 2006. Uh, they're represented there, so most of their uh, projects were E and G. You'll also notice uh, that our research, that at ASU we did two major projects. One was for the rec center, $7 million, and uh, $35 million uh, for the Plaza Verde Residence Hall. Uh, the system office building there was $2 million that we spent on the Tech Plaza uh, to allocate additional space for <coughs> FPNC. Uh, technology commercialization and development. Uh, the the, the uh, projects, if you looked at all the total of all the projects there for the Texas Tech University system, 557 million, 53% uh, was TTU debt, 
I will mention this was extraordinary times in the fact that debt financing was almost cheap, almost, almost not. <coughs> pardon me, almost synonymous with cash. Chokes me up to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway. That's the funniest thing I think you've said. <laughs> <laughs> so debt financing was just about equal uh, to debt, a uh, big paid cash from project. You want me to take over from here? Jim? Yeah, I'll okay. take <laughs> my, cardio my cardiologist is going to take over the whole thing. DTU cash, 18%. Uh, HSC debt, as I mentioned, is primarily their TRBs. And ASU debt is the two projects, the rec center and the housing system. On page eight, you'll note that the uh, that there shows that it's been a very lucrative time to borrow, so therefore mo a sizable portion, thank you, Christina, of our financing has been in debt. Uh, page nine uh, reflects the source of funds uh, that are going to go back toward paying the total debt. Revenues includes both the housing system <laughs> I feel like I have a medical emergency. <laughs> anyway, but I've got, oh, I wonder no. if there's any doctors in the crowd. Uh, Good doctors. No. Good doctors <laughs> in the crowd. <laughs> Call 911. <laughs> All right. Revenues uh, are primarily athletic revenues, housing and dining revenues. You'll see there that we've used student fees for things such as the rec center, uh, some student union fees and things such as that. You'll also notice, notice that we spend heath on many of these capital projects, TRBs, and gifts. Turning to page 11, uh, you'll note there that these are projects that have been completed, totaling about $100 million. These projects have been completed, and they're in what we call short-term debt financing. This is uh, commercial paper that we borrow for somewhat for terms of 90 days uh, to 270 days, our current interest rate that we're paying on this paper while we're awaiting long-term conversion into debt is approximately 40 basis points. Uh, on, page, on page 13, we begin looking at the projects for the next five years. The first part of the, pro the projects, the first four projects, or TR. Before you get off that, yeah. point, when do you expect to bond this? Uh, right now, I'm, I'm looking at about the summer of 2015, about a year from now. With what's happening in the debt market, a lot of people yeah, yeah, I mean, not, my sense would be that by the summer of 15, rates will start going up. Okay. The, election. Uh, the Fed has stopped by, and, and interest rates have started rising. That, that's my only concern, too. Well, that, that is a call that I would would like the board to help me on, of when we should go long and convert the short term debt. I, I think right. that, okay. Yeah, well, I, right. I mean, I think that you've got great advisors, but I right. mean, real, realistically, you know, the, the Fed's not borrowing $85 billion a month to buy treasuries, and that's having an impact on the market. Well, that, that, is, that is what our advisors you know, they said that definitely we ought to be thinking about something in 2015. Whether that's early or late was was a question for them. So, I, I think y'all, you both, uh, Regents Walker, uh, Regents Francis, y'all are both on target. Uh, it's just a question of when we go in 2015. Jim, how long does it take to get ready to do a bond offer? Oh, it takes us about 90 days. Uh, the there was another pacing item. That was that was kind of directing my thoughts, Mr. Francis, when we, we got into this. Is I really wanted to see if we were going to get TRB by the time that we needed to borrow money. And since the state was paying for that, I thought it might be better to wait and defer that until then. So it was a trade-off between the possibility of TRBs coming online and interest rates. And I, 
I, I have no <coughs> crystal ball. Can TRBs come online for projects you've already oh, completed? Blended? No. I mean, so. No, this, this is for projects that would be approved in 2015, if any. But you, you're talking about money that's already out the door? Oh, on the on the hundred million, right. I, I mean, yeah, I'm, right. I'm referring right. to the hundred million and looking at that right. window of when would be opportune to kind of take that long term. Right, you're correct. Uh, one of the one of the trade offs that I face there is that the larger the bond issuance, the the broader base that I can spread the fixed cost of the bond issuance. So where that point crosses is is, is a point that we have control over. Uh, the first four projects on this list are TRB projects. Uh, I, I would ask the chancellor. Uh, this reflects basically a uh, one project per component. And I'd like the chancellor to talk a little bit about the work that he believes we need to do on TRBs this session. Thank you, Jim. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the last time that the legislature approved TRBs was in 2006. And that, uh, since that time, we've gone through at least one budget shortfall uh, area and then a political battle last session. Uh, I think the legislature was certainly inclined to do it last session, but at the end of the session, there just couldn't be agreement between the House and the Senate. And it was quite a, it was a very generous package. So I think we anticipate that that'll be a major issue this coming session. Um, you know, typically, um, the, the sticker shock, uh, because we haven't done anything since 2006 and there, there's a lot of pent-up demand, uh, could probably uh, result in, in uh, projects, at least in this round, being like one, you get one project per year or, or one project per campus. And uh, uh, so there's already been discussions about cutting even back a little bit on the amount. So, you, so we've got, for example, a 97 Point seven million dollar uh, request. It might end up being some percentage of that. Typically, the legislature likes for the universities to have what they call skin in the game. So that's part of the, kind of what we'll look at as we go through. But it'll certainly be a priority on our governmental relations uh, watch list as we go through the session. Thank you, Judge. Uh, there are two projects here one, uh, that are not TTU related. One is the HSC at El Paso School of Nursing building, that's underway, and the uh, system administration building. The rest of the projects there uh, reflect TTU building buildings. You'll see there that uh, many of these projects are underway or are in some progress toward construction, totaling $141 million and $442 million is still to be approved by the board. Turning to page, our page 14, uh, this kind of is a breakout plan for the next five years. Uh, academic projects at TTU totaling 23%, one residence hall totaling 11%, uh, TRB uh, uh, bonds totaling about a third of the new debt, athletics 3%, a small amount, and I'll have some more comments about athletics in a minute and then other uh, comments. On page 15 is a timetable of when these projects are expected to, uh, to uh, require cash. Uh, you'll notice here that, as, as you would expect, most of the projects are in the near term, especially the ones that have board approval, and we will continue to look at this schedule. This gives us a planning schedule uh, for future future debt. All of these projects, uh, the majority of these projects on here, except for the El Paso School of Nursing and the System Administration Building are TTU projects. Athletics projects are always interesting on page 16. Uh, it's uh, very interesting that the smaller projects, they were able to sort of uh, plot and, and define when they would be uh, coming uh, to need cash. Uh, the larger projects, it's a, it's a very different process in the fact that they are in the midst of fundraising and as the fundraising uh, reaches a point where we're pretty 
it's pretty clear that we're going to succeed in our fundraising, we would be able to do the projects, then we'll consider putting them on a calendar. Dr. Nellis, would you like to talk about the athletic projects? Yes, again, uh, I think you're all familiar with these and uh, very important as we advance uh, athletics, uh, the, um, the fearless uh, campaign for fearless champions. Um, again, the, the whole idea, though, is to secure private commitment before we move forward with these so that we don't uh, add to our uh, debt in a way that would distract from our ability as an institution to invest in our academic and research areas. So uh, again, I'm optimistic. We're already, um, I think, almost halfway there as far as commitments we've received uh, to date. And um, so I think these projects, again, are very important as we advance uh, our competitive edge here at Texas Tech, being part of one of the big five uh, conferences and being within the big 12. Thank you, Dr. Nose. On page 17 is the TRB projects. Uh, those projects, if they were approved in 2015, in May of 2015, uh, we'd begin the planning and the uh, architectural work in 2016 and probably start turning dirt in 2017 or thereabouts with spending uh, the money on construction in 2017, 18, and 19. Uh, page, page 18 and then page 19 begins our credit profile. Uh, I, I think the uh, summary of the, the next two credit profiles that you're going to look, uh, look at regarding the Texas Tech University is that we are in solid shape with regards to our credit profiles. Uh, this was a presentation that Wells Fargo did at a recent conference in the state of Texas, uh, comparing the seven, six rather uh, systems of higher education in the state of Texas, in what some in what they considered, in the verbiage that they put on it at the presentation, these are four significant measures that Moody's uh, rates universities on. Moody's does a comprehensive review of the credit of each university. There are. There are three major credit rating in entities, Moody's, Standard and & Poor's, and Fitch's, and we go through a review by those organizations every year. Operating margin, for lack of a better term, this would be profitability. You'll see that the Texas Tech University system is healthy at 2.6%. Uh, a debt service to operations, in other words, a ratio of how much this would be equivalent to your uh, mortgage uh, to your other expenses in, in applying for a loan for a house, for example. Uh, this is the percent there. Uh, expendable financial resources to comprehensive debt. Uh, the higher the number, the better there. In other words, more liquidity and expendable financial resources to operations once again, a measure of relative liquidity. Uh, basically, within each of the categories, I ranked the various, uh, our, the ranks of the, uh, of the six systems. Uh, for example, on the operating margin, you'll see that Texas Tech is second. Uh, the University of Houston is first. Uh, uh, North Texas is sixth, and so forth and so on. Then I added up all four rankings uh, and then came up with an overall composite ranking of, of uh, the various systems and came up with the uh, Texas Tech University system being number one. Uh, this is kind of a pretty sloppy statistics, statistical analysis, but nonetheless, it is an analysis. Uh, number <laughs> we thought it was pretty good. We don't know how we feel about the CFO saying it's sloppy county. <laughs> well, I caution that this is a statistical analysis being pre presented by the, a statistician, so that makes it credible. Okay. <laughs> page page twenty uh, is the same measures uh, looking at the at the Big 12 public institutions, all except the Uni Oklahoma State University. 
There, likewise, when we compare ourselves to the other Big 12 schools, uh, we are near the top in being uh, tied for first with the University of Kansas. I actually think the University of Kansas, since they have uh, more number ones, uh, this is probably pretty indicative that they're probably a pretty sound institution. Why is OSU uh, not in? Pardon me? Why isn't Oklahoma State included? They didn't provide it. Yeah. Oh. So. <laughs> That's, you know, I don't know why they don't provide it. <laughs> uh, this is an interesting analysis on page 21. Uh, the Moody scorecard, as I mentioned, is the way that is a document that supposedly determines our, our uh, credit rating. It'd be like uh, uh, Equino, uh, Equifax, uh, those up rating agencies, they all have their black boxes that they put in a bunch of numbers to, and it gets a rating agency. I think some of the positive things on this are that you'll notice here in the 40 uh, institution they chose, uh, they, by the way, they chose all the AA, uh, AAA institutions. There are eight of them. There are 20 AA1s, and we are rated AA2, of which there are 43. That means in the AA rating category, we are uh, the middle third tier, supposedly. You'll see there that the items in blue highlights are for the other uh, systems. Uh, we are in our market position. Uh, basically, this is determined by our students and our profile and how attractive we are. Uh, we're rated uh, ahead of the Texas A&M University system there, which is at 35th. Uh, on, on the operating performance, uh, you'll note there that tech is substantially higher in number 11, uh, rating ahead of some of our sister schools. And on our balance sheet uh, of numbers, uh, we're rated eighth in the note uh, in this comparison. These are various ratios uh, ahead of both uh, the University of Texas and Texas A&M University systems. So our relative ranking is very good. And that's reflected on the, on the right four uh, column five columns. Uh, you'll see that our overall rank th is 11. Uh, Moody's ranking has us double A two, the third column. And if they just went on the scorecard alone, uh, we could be rated as high as double A one, which is their far right column. There's a lot more that goes into the rating, uh, just like any credit profile. And so that's why we're still rated double A2. There's only one institution in double A2 that has a positive outlook, and that's the Penn State University system. In this thing with Moody's, uh, are we close to a positive outlook? Pardon me, I didn't. Yeah, I mean, based upon this, we would be close to a positive outlook. But have, have you had conversation with Moody's or S&P about that? I've had. I've had conversations uh, with Moody's about a positive outlook, and uh, uh, this was before I had this level of detail, and uh, I'm gonna have those conversations again. The, the credit rating agencies come to us every year, and for the last three years, I said, our trends, I, I was looking at our internal trends, and I said, our internal tre trends merit at least a positive because I you can see that we're headed toward a uh, uh, higher rating and they they've agreed with me said they would take it to their credit committee but then it disappears in the credit committee and it's come back double a two so I, that's a good point and we'll continue to push that uh, on a I guess most of our financings are 30 year yes uh, it is and so on a 30 year if we were double A one versus double A two, how many basis points would that be? About twenty. About twenty basis points. So if you were uh, financing uh, hundred and fifty million, what would that be? Three hundred thousand? So one. On page twenty three 
I've always asked the question, well, how much debt can we have? And this is a question that is kind of a, a rolling average. And here you have to look at, at trends and you have to look at where we are. We have traditionally, meaning the Texas Tech University system, been a very lean institution and uh, we have used debt very selectively, uh, more so than some of our other college schools. Uh, the, the items on top here, well, one of the questions I'm asked is how much more debt could we borrow? Uh, we always are very concerned about making sure that we have some capacity for future generations and that we, we reflect that and uh, go forward on that. Uh, this basically takes our system annual financial report, which is on top there, and uses the numbers there and then looks at Moody's ratings for AA2. This is developed with the concept that if we don't go past the median on AA2, which we're, where we're currently rated, if we're in the bottom below these medians, then the likelihood is that our credit rating would not be adjusted. I can't imagine any way if you stayed below the median on five critical measures such as this that you would see the ratings adjusted downward. Uh, by the way, two of our Big 12 colleagues in the past two years have had their ratings adjusted downward when they issued substantial new debt on their facilities. Uh, unrestricted resources to debt, for example, is 0.49. Well, remembering back to your eighth grade math, uh, you have uh, if you have two of the three in any kind of ratio, we have the unrestricted resources above at 760 million divided by 0.49, then we get $1.5 million billion dollars that we could issue in debt. Each one of these lines are what we would call critical measures of our debt. And then we calculate our capacity based upon that. If you notice that if we took the five measures and equally weighted them, we get one number, 933 million. Then with our financial analyst, I sat down and we weighted them and said, you know, the unrestricted resources to debt, in other words, how much liquidity do you have versus debt and how much options do you have to prevent you getting in trouble with debt uh, we ought to rate that very high. And so we assigned a weighting to it of 45%, and then coming down the chart there to get to the green number down at the bottom, that's the maximum debt. Uh, that's the debt that we could stay at and we'd still below the medians on all of these charts. All right, on the next page. Can I, can I yeah, this something is. For the board? Um, you, you made a statement about debt into the future, and, and looking at debt is dynamic because you, you have to look at, at your your revenues and operating income right. on the other side of that, and and so you you're you're almost looking at it in a static situation. Very uh, good point. Yeah. And and so uh, I mean I'm I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that, but it's very unrealistic. Yeah. That's, that, that is very correct and that is right on point. You know, it, it, it's a lot like when you buy a home and they run a credit profile for you and they say, this is your credit profile and you're able to buy this size house. Some, some folks want to stretch that credit profile and say, well, I'll be making more money over the course of 30 years. So being a little bit tight at the beginning is not a problem. Other people say, I want to have insurance that that credit rating, that, it, that I might expect my income to go down a little bit, can I have some protection on that side? The tendency is for people to say, my income's going to grow, so if it's a little bit tight here at the beginning, I can stretch it. This, this capacity uh, analysis in debt uh, calculates the same thing 
that it's static in 2013 going forward, where is it going to be? And when you look out 20 years, uh, to, to, to th 2020 rather, I should say, five years, uh, that's why it's important to look at this every year to see the trends. Are you closing on the, uh, the, the capacity or is the capacity rising equally with your, uh, with your uh, uh, debt? On page page 24, we put the the final uh, analysis together. The green bar on this page is basically what it is with the weighted debt capacity on the previous page, and as Richard Walker has noted, that's flat from 2013 on. The red bar represents equally weighted. That's uh, that's the capacity uh, if each of those measures was equally weighted. The uh, purple bar, or the purple line rather, uh, reflects what the, this board has already approved, while the blue line reflects the fact of projects that we've identified as likely. The main change in the blue line right here is approximately $300 million in TRBs. TRBs are interesting in the way that they play into our debt profile and debt capacity. TRBs at the macro level or the institution level when we're compared to other institution, institutions are considered as part of our debt and they're taken in, into consideration that way. At a micro level, when we get our, our own credit rating, we're able to argue, usually successfully with the rating agencies, that there is some commitment from the state to help fund that. So they take that into account. So being on the, on even being a little bit over, it's not as big a problem as you might think for an institution that only had to rely upon its revenues. This assumes that by the upper end of this blue bar, uh, of the of the one billion dollars in debt, about four hundred million dollars approximately uh, would be two uh, TRBs. So there's some argument that we should discount the amount that's in the blue line to reflect the TRB consideration. Could, could you say in a different way if you if you uh, look at yes growth in the the uh, blue line? that if you extended that, it'd be somewhere in between, which is probably a more realistic way of looking at it. Yes, it would be. And that's what I would probably do if I, in my mind, if I'm sketching this, I would extend the uh, debt capacity and the TRBs <coughs> discounted. Proportionally. And yeah. say proportionally, and, and I'd, I'd be very satisfied with where we are right now on the planning horizon. And the, the TRB debt, related debt is priced with the state of Texas's credit rating or our credit rating? Our credit rating. Yeah. And it's counted in our numbers. It's our numbers or it's our debt. And so, oh. we go, you know, I guess that's the question it's that we right. have to look at is if you get the TRBs, do you really look at that debt just a little differently than you do the other, even though it's it's calculated in, but does, does it allow us to go up that. on what we feel comfortable on debt because that's a state backed? Yeah, it's we we have no offset revenue on our on our on our balance sheet, and so it really is kind of interesting. You know, it's it's dead on our books, and that therein lies the problem. And that's exactly what I'm saying, Mr. Every other at the macro every other level, in the state has this problem. Yeah, yeah. every other school in the state of Texas has this issue, right. and and thank goodness that we've been working on this for now about 15 years. Uh, with the credit rating agencies, and they understand the uniqueness of Texas. Uh, the uh, the debt TRBs go back to approximately the mid 1970s, and there's never been an instance when they didn't fund it coming forward. There's been one instance about 10 years ago where they didn't fund as much as people thought, but they allowed people to adjust their TRB funding for that. Is this chart implying then that including TRBs, that we're approximately raw math around $600 million in outstanding debt today? 
Yes. Okay. 548. Yeah. Uh, and we've got the, the, the yaw between where we are today and what we are to maintain our credit rating is about 400 million. Correct. Is that what is that what this chart is right. trying to tell us? Okay. And if you turn forward to page 25, <coughs> Mr. Anders has been reading ahead. No, I haven't. And I actually, haven't. I know you haven't. <laughs> but this I is did that on my own without yeah, this chart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then the next time you can do this. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, I get more choked up than you would. <laughs> the, the, but, but what this does reflect, the first line there is our old principal. Then we have some CP, our short-term paper. And then when you see the CP there, that's all the, the CP lines or C, the commercial paper being converted to long-term debt at various times. You see it, first of all, in, in uh, 2017, in 15 rather, then you see it more of it coming online at various times in the future. That gives you the trend on the line and uh, that's what this chart is about because as, as correctly stated by some of the regions, you also have debt coming off of this chart at a, at, mm -hmm. at a measured pace. So you've got to look at how the new debt coming on interacts with the debt being coming off the chart. On page 27, is a little bit of a discussion. But before uh, we move on to that, yeah. have we re-amortized our debt to reflect historic low rates, all our legacy debt? Yes, we have. Okay. Yes, we have. Two years ago. Uh, we, we, we squeeze that hard every time we go out. Okay. Was about and uh, uh, the, we, we, we've done it now that we're, we're completely caught up with our previous debt. We did it about two years ago, didn't we? Uh, t uh, January of 2012. 12. Yeah, I remember that. So, and we squeezed it then, and uh, I think we, we just about got everything out. You know, it's really interesting because all the debt lines start out very low, come up to about a point at 10 years, and then go up even higher at, at 30 years. And what you're really doing is just sliding that whole scale forward. And, uh, you know, when, when, when folks said originally, you know we're going to we're going to have low interest rates for uh, one to three years and then it's going to start up well it turns out that prediction has has not occurred and we keep sliding this one to three year prediction out as we go forward on page 27 is some talking points about west village uh, we have talked with president nellis you want to talk about some of your observations about uh, the West Village phase two. Well, I think uh, um, in looking at this, you know, we've delayed the the uh, initiation of this project until the fall of uh, completion for fall of 2017. We do have some immediate needs, but we're providing some uh, uh, incentives, I guess, for upperclassmen to not be on campus. There are some significant academic success implications for. <coughs> for keeping freshmen and sophomores on campus. If you look at the success rate of students that are on campus and get engaged in the, the uh, social and academic community of the university, their success rates of retention go up like 25%. So it's significant. So uh, we do have some immediate needs though uh, for a, a residence hall completion. And part of it is from an academic perspective because Many universities that we're competing with on the uh, high end have uh, residence halls that are dedicated to unique themes. For example, the honors program. There's an engineering. We need an engineering hall. We need a we need a business uh, hall that where where we can have students from different selective areas uh, uh, engaged in in learning. We have some of that now, but we we don't have the complete spectrum of opportunities that we would have with this addition. So we feel like right now we could fill a facility like this, uh, even if we decide in the next year to increase our, uh, uh, the actually reduce the number of acceptances and, and increase the quality of our incoming class, we still would have uh, the significant demand to, uh, to meet this need. Are we still getting about an 11% return? Cash and on we cash. do get return. If this, if we, if we uh, 
go forward with this if you if the regions approve this you know the first six or seven years we're essentially subsidizing that but right. long term it's a significant financial return Noel is that generally the, the model so we we do make money on our residence halls and we will be as you see here retiring this debt on uh, Carpenter Wells in 2017 as well that, that is a good question those are good points uh, I, uh, after, uh, I, uh, th in the second bullet here, the net profit or the net before you, uh, transfers and debt services is about 23.7 million. Well, by the way, we pro forma this out in 2017. And so that's the year before the res hall would come online. And we, uh, most of the uh, revenue is coming from the older res halls. Uh, and even the net, after all transfers and debt service, will be about nine million dollars in 2017. Uh, it with the most of the debt that we'll have is is attributable to the new res halls and the Carpenter Wells debt service of 1.2 million will be retired uh, in 2017. One of the interesting things that I track is that the percent of the housing budget fixed by debt payments will rise from 18.1% in 2014 to 26.8% in 2018. That's all due to the West Village coming online uh, this year and the new res hall. And some, some pro formas on the new West Village too its revenues are about three, will be about three million, expenditures about 1.3, and our debt service 3.7 million. As President Nellis noted, uh, all the res halls lose money uh, initially, and then uh, they come online as, as, as they mature and begin making a profit for us. That's why it's important for us as an institution to look at our whole housing system and not just pull out parts of it and look at those. So that concludes my presentation. Jim, on, net, on the uh, net revenue, does that factor in renovations, maintenance that we do, or is that just on ops and debt? There, there's some, some budget in there for that. I'm, I'm sure that that trans that net re that net revenue in uh, 2017 of nine million will actually probably when we come about approving a budget for nine million will probably have some renovation problem projects taken out of that a significant number. Noel, you want to talk to that? Um, you know, as, as you know, over the past um, several summers, we've been going back through the old residence halls and putting substantial renovations in replacing windows for energy efficiency and upgrading the bathrooms. And so those have been um, six to seven million dollar projects and this coming up summer, summer of 15, will be the final one of the residence hall, the older residence halls that we're doing those projects on. So that substantial renovation in the, you know, six to seven million will, will drop off after this fiscal year, and they can will then have that cash to uh, put more to debt payments as well as just the, the minor renovations. Dr. Nellis, if you go forward with a new dorm, how does that play into the pursuit of being a uh, tier one research university? Can you speak to that just a minute? I, I, you caught my attention when you talked about these kind of pods that have focus on engineering or business or honors college so can you address that with us for just a minute right i think thank you regent anders for asking need more than just a minute yeah i mean i feel like i'm having to make a decision in a vacuum on one component you've got faculty you have scholarships you have all these right. things we have to fund and we're, we're being asked to make a decision in in a vacuum here but, but i don't right. think we're making a decision it's not approved. we're not approving it today yeah. Yeah. right 
and I certainly would like for exactly. reasons as far as that Walker to wait. Yeah, where there's no decision that yeah, we're answer. asking for today. Yeah. Misunderstood. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I think that's it's important. Great point, though, Rachel. But it's a very important point. Um, and I might mention, too, if, if you look at uh, page 14, just real quick, just the distribution of projects, and you include TRBs and academic projects, you can see that it's about um, four to one, uh, the relationship on academic projects that we want to invest in versus the residence hall. Uh, so we've really looked at that very carefully. Rather than spending all of our investment uh, on the residence hall side, we're, we're trying to be pull back and really focus on the academic side. But relative to Regent Andrews' question, again, what we're competing with in Tier 1, they do have a lot of these top schools have specialized living communities where they really focus on not only the uh, the the the, um, the residential hall experience, but also from an academic perspective, they have business students living with other business students and engineering students and the honors college, and uh, we have not had as much flexibility with that type of space, uh, just because we're just so tight with our residence halls, and I think that this type of addition we could keep in mind that that opportunity which would help us recruit some of the top students. When we're going after the top students, it's a lot of variables that they're making decisions on. And I think one of those is can they live in that type of selective, focused environment? I think it's also important to look at this chart. That on the TRB projects, which make up about 50% of it, those are E and G projects. So as Dr. Nellis pointed out, even though 20, it's really 25% plus 17% for TTU because their TRB request is actually going into a research building. It would be interesting to me that your, your point about creating some flexibility for these engineering and business, those tier one schools, I wonder if they have the same policy that freshman and sophomore has to live in dorms or if they create their own flexibility by not having that policy. My. I'd have to really analyze this carefully, but my experience in going to, you know, getting reports at national meetings, studying this carefully is that that's, that that's very common. The fresh, especially freshmen living on campus, because again, it's been proven over and over again that the issues, you just don't have the dropout issues, you don't have some of the other issues with students living off campus. and. And so uh, I think there's a lot of data that would support uh, uh, having freshmen. And we think sophomores as well because, um, again, if you look at the retention rates, you know, we're, trying to ask, we're trying to increase that significantly. We're at 83 percent now. We want to be at 90 percent by 2020. And uh, our freshman, to, uh, excuse me, our sophomore to junior retention rate uh, we're also trying to increase because we get another drop off of 10 to 15 percent there. So I do believe these living communities, and especially as they relate to certain uh, uh, majors, uh, have an, air, uh, an opportunity to enhance the support networks for these students for success. Madam Chair, I, I, that's, thank you, Dr. Nelson, answer my question. Uh, for, for now, I do agree with Regent Francis that this is a this is really about a whole policy direction, and where where we're going is a as an institution. But, but realistically, where we are right now, unless I misheard what you said, is we're, we're beyond capacity right now. And the, the only way that we're going to be able to function if we believe uh, that it is important to have freshmen living on campus, 25% uh, improvement in retention rate, that has to be part of, of uh, uh, moving toward being AAU a lot like. From a pure financial standpoint, residence halls, uh, you know, just pure financial standpoint, residence halls do end up generating revenues. Um, but, but I think I heard you say that effectively we're going to have to kick off campus, except for the new residence hall, everyone but freshmen, or, or we're not going to speak to that. Noel. Noel's, Noel's done a lot of analysis of that to look at meeting our basic freshman and sophomore needs and how many students at the junior or senior level are currently occupying our residence hall. So Noel, you might want to speak to that in general. Yeah, we, so we do have a lot of our um, upperclassmen that want to live on campus and I think that speaks very favorably of the, the residence halls that we have and the services that are provided in those halls. We, um, you know, we, currently we are at, um, this, this Monday, we opened up our residence hall applications for next fall. 
and it's only this week, it kind of goes in stages. So this week is only for those currently where you live, if you'd like to stay living where you live, you can <coughs> sign up. And then uh, next week it'll go if, if you want to come back and move somewhere else in a different hall, you can sign up for those. So I just want to say how positive West Village has been. Um, in the first week, we have already sold out 40% of our graduate student building, meaning those students are happy being there and have signed up to uh, return. And then the other one, the upperclassmen building, the first week we've had 14% um, re-sign up. One thing that we, we do have to do and we have to look at is um, how to meet the needs of our freshman class that come in. Um, we have a requirement of up to, if, you, if you're less than 30 semester credit hours of living on campus. Above that, you can live off campus. Um, so this year has seen a substantial um, enrollment growth, probably uh, unprecedented, we, not to be expected. Um, so there were some things that we probably didn't plan for in advance because we didn't know how successful the incoming freshman class was going to be. And I know that Chancellor and the President um, will be speaking to you about, you know, what our enrollment for future years looks like. And, you know, we might get one of our tighter, tightest years if we look at how to control growth and get the quality of the student. Um, but for next fall, we have um, put a cap right now, 1,300 beds on um, for the upperclassmen, those above 30 semester credit hours, um, so that we can make sure that we have sufficient beds for the incoming freshman class next year. And that's one uh, change that we're doing so that we can make sure that we um, have the capacity um, for the next couple years until we would look at putting another residence. And that's 1,300 versus what number yeah, for this year? Uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be precise. <laughs> I think we are closer to about, um, we're housing about 5,700 out of our 7,000 beds. So we have about the same um, 1,300. And so we're trying to make sure we keep it at that, again, so that we would have the 5,700 available for incoming freshmen and would we have that kind of incoming class coming next year. So. We make sure we're not going over what we are currently housing. So the numbers are about the same. Yes, sir. But you're just capping. But what we're what we're hoping to do, and what we did do, let me just say this, is that the ones that we're housing this year include 600 of the triple beds, and we are reducing that number. We're keeping it a smaller, um, we're reducing it in half, and only going to have um, those that want to elect in for the lower cost. Um, so we will be reducing the number of students that we can house next year by 300. Um, and just to say that in our first week, we've had three rooms um, of the triples that those students have signed up and want to stay in the triple rooms again next year. So some are liking um, that, that uh, lower cost option and, and self-choosing to enroll in it for again next fall. Yeah. John, where I was going with, with this is that that, that uh, as we move more to AAU like status in that pursuit, which is a policy of this board, the when you start talking about this kind of growth at the undergraduate level, you start having conflicting conflicting mm -hmm. philosophies, and, and I think that's something our, this board is going to have to undertake in short order and determine where where are its priorities, what do we really want to be, and, and, and where are we trying to go. And it's not. I don't think that if you hold it at thirteen hundred. If that's the same number, I thought that it was a reduction from about 1,500. Uh, you're you're actually not going to be able to accommodate the freshmen because you know I would anticipate we'd have some growth in freshmen, yeah. and we're over capacity anyway. I I mean I don't understand the numbers. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that during my presentation, but, oh, okay. uh, but I do I'm not sure that that's the case. So we'll have more freshmen on campus fall, and, and part of the start this year actually this year we had the lowest list the lowest acceptance rate in the last 12 years and we that's as far back as we went the lowest acceptance rate this year this is 
despite the dynamics of what you've seen in the data, the lowest acceptance rate. And so as we so the quality of our student is rising, then. Is that what that's implying? Well, Apple. It's no, no, that. Apple. When we, when we Apple. Apple. I'm yeah, sorry? We turn more away. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, but the mix of those, you know, the distribution within those that were accepted, that's, you know, we have to monitor that carefully. And that's where scholarship dollars are going to be important for getting that. Yeah. If you move towards the EU status to get the higher proportion of those top students. And I think the living environment for those top students, that's one of the things they're going to be looking at, too. So that's that where it leads to the residence hall. So I'm not sure, but the, the comment about are we going to continue to grow that freshman class, I think is the decision of this board, certainly, and I need to recognize it because the, I think there are, there are ways that we continue to see the university yes, grow it's because of the profile, but, market but maybe the freshman class isn't quite as big as this year. This may have been the biggest. Were applications up? We have applications up. Yes. No, were they last year when oh, the were up? Up. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the percentage was applicable to the number that had applied. Okay, I feel better. <laughs> I'd like to give the opportunity to reach us as far as the walker to, if you've got any comments, because y'all really worked with the <coughs> branches on um, this project. I'm not sure that, that I nor you, uh, since we really haven't delved into this, and, and thank you, uh, <coughs> Regent Monford, for uh, asking us to do this project. And is, uh, uh, Mr. Brunges said, "We this is something that we do need to look at at least once annually, I think. But, but I think that the, uh, the, the thing that we should be, uh, have a good feeling about is that our system is being managed so well that if anything, we really do deserve to be a double A one rather than a double A two. And that would, uh, despite the fact that we were not a participant in the, the Puff Fund, that would put us in the same status as A&M. And in many instances, we exceed A&M in the way we manage our business. Um, and, uh, and I think that some of the things that, that we've looked at should make us feel good about the projects, where we uh, are. I mean, a double A status, is uh, is you know something uh, incredibly good to have achieved, but to be on the 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 have the possibility of of the highest level of double A says a lot. And like you said, I, I believe you said this uh, that there are only 11 triple A universities, public universities, in the country, and so. Uh, that uh, I feel very good uh, about where we are from a debt capacity standpoint. I think that if we look uh, to the future, we should feel very good about it, and uh, we have the the ability to to do that. And and again, we have to look at it uh, on a dynamic basis in terms of uh, our ability to generate revenues during that same time. It's it's unfair to look at it uh, on one hand. Uh, you know, assigning the, some, some growth in your debt levels without looking at the, the corresponding revenue increase. Uh, this is a fascinating exercise, I think, for all of us. I know in particular. Um, just to have the opportunity to talk to all of you and ask the question about strategically, where do you see your components fitting in to the facilities and, and, and the projects that we're looking at? Uh, Always good to tap the brakes, especially with new leadership coming in and saying, "Are we still? Do we still strike a good balance between quality and affordability?" And I don't think anybody here wants to see that quality go down. I mean, that, that would make no sense. But at the same time, 35,000 students—that's impressive. You look back 10 years, you look back 20 years. We're going to continue to grow. We just have to be responsible for the means in which we grow and making sure that that student, and I know that's some, we spent some time asking that question um, in discussion, just you and I, about 
well, what do those numbers look like when it comes to the quality of the student? Are we pushing for 40 because we want to get to that number? Or are, are we still strategically aligned so that we're going to get to that number eventually? We don't need to put a date on it because we want to see the quality continue. Page 13, the discussion on TRVs, and I've had that discussion with everyone as well. And, and fortunately, we, we brought in and, and we've got an expert sitting with us at the table when it comes to TRVs. And over the years, as to what happens, I think we certainly have to prepare for the fact that if, if we do not get TRVs, um, well, even if we do, uh, Dr. May, when, you did, when we got TRVs last time, I don't believe ASU got a project in 06, if I'm not mistaken. So it's, it is a, do we actually, there's winners and losers when it comes to TRVs. It's not across the board. Everybody gets what they want. And as was alluded to earlier, uh, maybe it's 90%, maybe it's 80%, and it's going to be our responsibility to fill the debt capacity of our own institution on these TRVs. So politically speaking, that's going to be a big question out there. I, 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 had a lot of I had a lot of optimism that we were going to get those last time. And the political makeup of the state and its elected officials now, in, in my opinion, is moving further in the direction that is, that is not necessarily beneficial for TRVs. We're going to have to see. And we're going to have to all work hard to get that. The good news is it's not just Texas Tech. We're, we're not alone in that fight. And, and there should be some, you know, we're, we're now deregulated. So there should be some responsibility to the state when it comes to we're going to educate the students now we need the facilities to put them in and it's not all about the students in the back of the room still here that are saying hey we'll put we'll take some responsibility on um congratulations it doesn't take there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of students out there in other institutions that will make that commitment but you guys stepping forward i think says a lot about this institution and it says a lot about the partnerships that we're willing to go into it's not all about just on the taxpayers alone. So we're sending a strong message by taking on a project like we have over at the business school and saying, hey, we're, we'll, we're all in on this. And that's, that's fantastic. It's a good example. So thank you guys. Um, the quality of the degree, I, I think it centers around that for us. And, and the more that I've talked to my colleagues about it, and, and certainly all of you individually, that to me is the common denominator. The rest of this, we're going to figure out where to strategically align ourselves so that it is not necessarily a race to 40, but the right race to 40. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Before we conclude this item, and I know I'd like to ask the Chancellor if you want to weigh in a little bit on this. Um, hopefully what this has done is spurred some policy discussion about uh, enrollment growth and how that matches up with strategic plans that we already have approved in place. Um, from the facility <coughs> committee uh, standpoint, you know, our obligation to review each facility request that comes to us and um, not look at it at, in a silo that we don't look at the president, just look at uh, Mr. Brunches and say, oh, is this okay for us to build? But it also um, is geared back to looking at strategic plan and are we building what we've all approved that we feel that we need to do to go forward. Um, also, the review of debt. Where do we want to put our debt? And how much do we want to encumber the institution years in advance because there are boards that are going to follow and we want them to have potential for growth and make decisions. So they're all, they're, they're big items to take on. And I appreciate very much everyone's participation in the discussion. Um, Chancellor, I know that you mentioned that you have a task force. Would you like to comment on that or is that gonna be something you do in your other presentation? Okay, all right. Is there any other discussion about this? And I know Mr. Chairman at some point we'll have to figure out when we have this discussion about the larger policy issues. Um, Chairman Monford, thank you for bringing this to our attention and the whole committee, because this, this is a discuss the elephant in the room that needs to be discussed. Uh, and, and the quicker we have this strategic discussion uh, about the future of the TTU and the system, uh, the quicker we'll send the messages to uh, the leadership as to the, how to align the finances and the, and the missions of University. It's great. 
Uh, I believe that we are just, this is a report that's not, that we're voting uh, on this particular report. Uh, Christina, let me ask, do we need to receive the report officially? Ben, no. Okay, thank you. It's just a report and it's, we've discussed it, so we're going to move on. Yes, Next item. Okay, item five is our typical report on all FPNC work going across the state. Uh, I'll just say it is attached in your binder for your review. There's really only one project I wanted to bring up uh, before I get there. All projects are on schedule and on budget, uh, and we're in good position to deliver to this prospective component institutions for use. Uh, the plant soil science facility uh, has hit a couple challenges. We're seeing some cost escalation out in the market as we bid, as we're bidding projects right now. Um, our first step is to work with the dean, which he's doing a great job, Dean Galley and his team, to modify scope, be it, be it aesthetic or interior kind of issues in terms of space to not have to increase any funding, which that is what we're doing today. So uh, just giving you a heads up that, you know, sometimes we do, we do face some challenges with the bid market out there, but has not hit, nor we are requesting, uh, nor are we requesting more funding for that. It's just a, kind of the only challenge point we're dealing with right now. Uh, the rest of the projects feel like they're, um, they're moving, or they are moving well and the system office issue uh, in terms of the planning process is underway and um, under the review of the chancellor's office with you know headcount data and programming uh, which i was working on up to about 9 a.m this morning so sorry for being sorry for being late on that but uh, when you kicked off but other than that madam chair everything is in order and and moving well the increase is due to material increase it is material and labor uh, you know there's a funny story over here at west village we we had 15 men in a van get out, tool belts, their sheet rockers walking right at the end of the job over from parking lot to the facility. An oil field truck, nothing against the oil industry, but the oil field truck uh, pulls up, guy leans out and says, what are you, quote, what are they paying you guys? They threw a number out and he said, I'll pay you three times the amount they're paying you today if you'll get in the truck and drive south. And those, all 15 guys got in the truck and drove south. So we are dealing with some challenges in the labor market. And, uh, that never happens to me. Yeah, so uh, carry tool belts around. You might find a good yeah, deal on the street. Do. Anyway, thank you for the question. But yes, we are dealing with some challenging issues in terms of materials and well, labor. Those were all vice chancellors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, They've gone to that work and not for profit. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, that's all I had today. Thank okay, you, uh, before I get to Nancy, um, uh, is there any uh, questions about our ongoing projects at this particular time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I believe, Rich, you know, you want to go back. back to the School of Business. You, you said 30 to 30, 38,000 square feet. Where's that 8,000 coming off? And are we repeating the sins of the past when we short sightedly didn't build? I shouldn't say short sightedly. We were unable to build the full build out in 06 or 07 when this all happened does this 8,000 create a vacuum that we're they're going to come back and say well because we didn't build that extra amount where where are you going to trim 8,000 square feet yeah so uh the original plan done in 08 had a, had a 38,000 square foot vision for whatever the program was at the time and today there's some new programmatic uh, issues going on within the institution under Dr. Nail, you know, rethinking those things. So the, the idea right now is to say, we want to build, we would love to build the 38,000 square feet, but we've been given a cap of $15 million from a fiscal perspective. This is as much as we're willing to spend at this time. That's affordable, and, and Mr. Brown just would have to talk about that. So what we did is marry the 15 to the 38. We really, we know we can build in the lower 30s, but from programmatically, let's say rather than a lots of individual offices, they become big spaces that are open air and more uh, bullpen style. Our costs go down, our okay. dollar goes a little longer on the square footage. We just need to think through all those things first, which that has not kicked off. The programming process has not kicked off. And there could be the solution where maybe we build the 38,000 and you know, we shell, mm -hmm. not dirty shell, but clean shell, white space shell up to about whatever it is, five, 6,000 square feet. That, so we just got a lot of flexibility okay. built into the plan at this point in time. Thank you. And, and costs are escalating down. Yeah, so yeah. build it now. That's correct. Thank you. Are there any other questions from Mr. Molina with regards to the facilities presentation? If not, thank you very much.
very much. The chairman, this concludes uh, the report of the facilities committee. Thank you, Chairman Bobber. Outstanding work. Very good. Outstanding work. Chairman, finance, finance administration committee. Finance and Administration Committee has called to order. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting held on August 7th, 2014. So moved. Motion. Is there a second? Uh, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sloan, please begin with item number one. <laughs> Where's Rick? Thank you. Thank you. Um, TTU has just one finance agenda item uh, to bring forward to the board today, and that is to request to approve a budget adjust adjustment for TRIP funding received from the state. Uh, the, the 81st Texas Legislature created the Texas Research Incentive Program, or TRIP, which establishes a matching fund for qualified gifts received by the emerging research institutions and TTU continues to benefit from this matching fund. We received a distribution for our FY15, we received a distribution for FY15 on September 8th in the amount of the $8,081,615 and one penny. We're requesting board approval for a budget adjustment for the FY15 supplemental trip allocation received, and this will be used for research-related expenditures. Any questions? I second the minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hearing no questions, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Mr. Cooksey, please present item number two. Item number two is a gift related naming for the Department of Internal Medicine at the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. Uh, this is to name the, uh, the department I just mentioned for J.T. and Margaret Talkington. It would be the J.T. and Margaret Talkington Department of Internal Medicine in recognition of the generous gifts that J.T. and Margaret Talkington Charitable Foundation have recently made. Uh, the donor, of course, confer, uh, concurs with uh, naming this department. The uh, uh, Charitable Foundation recently uh, has made gifts establishing six endowed chairs in internal medicine. Those are in endocrinology, gastroenterology, rheumatology, and infectious disease and internal medicine. And in recognition of these gifts, the Department of Internal Medicine would become known as the J.T. and Margaret Talkington Department of Internal Medicine. Thank you, Mr. Cooksey. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, uh, one comment, you know, we keep talking about scholarships and professorships, and that's it right there. That's what we need. And, and if I could add, this is uh, uh, these the, the dollar amount of these gifts that are doing this represent uh, a less than ten, uh, well, about uh, yeah, about eight, twelve percent. Excuse me, about twelve percent of the total contributions made by J.T. and Margaret Talkington when they were alive, the uh, the Talkington Estate, and now the Talkington Foundation, and that's a total across TTU and TTU HSC. It's very significant. But I, I would assume that those chairs are at least a million apiece, aren't they? One and a half. One and a half. One point okay. five. So six times. Fascinating. Great. Anything else? Is there a motion to approve the item as presented? Second. Motion, motion is second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the meeting of the Finance and Administration Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Neil, the academic clinical and student affairs committee. The academic clinical and student affairs committee is called to order. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting held on August 7th, 2014. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Same Aye. sign. Motion carries. Dr. Flores, will you please begin with item number one from ASU? Thank you, Regent Neal. Angelo State seeks approval to expand the admission policy for dual credit students. We currently have a policy for dual credit students that attend classes on the ASU campus. And we are looking to expand dual credit opportunities.
for students at their high school. Uh, we would partner with the high schools to have uh, high school teachers that have the credentials to, to teach the university level courses at the high school. So specifically what we are looking for is uh, our new admission policy would allow students who have a B average or they're in the top half of their class or they could be recommended by their high school principal or counselor. And the reason we indicate high school principal or counselor is because perhaps the high school principal or the counselor would know of a unique situation that a student could benefit from taking the ASU dual credit course. Uh, this is also a process very close to our file review policy that we have cur currently in place for our uh, regular um, freshmen and also for the dual credit students that are taking courses uh, at ASU. Students that are admitted would then be required to uh, have passed the, or be in compliance with the DSI requirements, the Texas State Initiative requirement, to be able to enroll in the specific course that they're wanting to take. Uh, we believe that this will be a, um, a benefit for the students, and it will also be a benefit for Angelo State University. Uh, not only would we have uh, the curriculum being delivered, but we would also begin to have uh, academic advising for these students. And uh, we believe that we would be able to transition these students from high school dual credit students to Angelo State first time freshmen at a much higher rate. Any questions? What kind of numbers are you hoping for? Well, we hope to at some point be at about a thousand dual credit students. Mm -hmm. We are going to go specifically towards uh, larger schools who already have uh, high school teachers that are credentialed. Uh, we are looking at certain strategic areas in the state that we believe uh, can produce those numbers within the next uh, either the spring semester or the next academic year. So beyond your territory? Your, Excuse me? Be, so you're beyond looking beyond your counties? Absolutely, yes. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Good. Are there any other questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Same sign. Thank you, Dr. Thank Flores. You. Dr. Skuvenek, will you present this very controversial next item? He didn't even hear me. Yeah. Do you have your hearing aids in? <laughs> I will try not to get into any character flaws during this. Did you hear what I did you hear what I said? Well, I know I did. <laughs> are they are they back oh. in the office again? I, I was asked you that to wouldn't come up. I asked you to please prevent that present this very controversial item. Oh. No. Oh. Present. Oh. <laughs> You're trouble. Well, okay. Well, Madam Chair, Chairman Long, members of the board, uh, I am pleased to bring before you two recommendations for the granting of tenure. I'm especially pleased to recommend Robert Duncan, the Chancellor of the Texas Tech University System and Professor of Law. As you know, <clears throat> professor, professor Duncan, <laughs> Chancellor Duncan, uh, has served Duncan. in the Senate and the House and was uh, a graduate, 1981 graduate of our School of Law. The second recommendation is for Sheila Scott Haswell, who's a new professor in the Department of Hospitality and Retail Management in the College of Human Sciences. Currently, she is a tenured associate professor in the School of Hotel and Restaurant Administration at Oklahoma State University. The faculty members whose names have been recommended have been judged worthy by the appropriate committees, <laughs> and the tenure policies have been carefully followed. Are there any questions or comments? Oh, no. Do we need a separate vote? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Hold your, cover your ears. Roll call. <laughs> it's with pleasure that we are in the process of granting you tenure. Personal comment. Uh, great. I didn't even have to ask. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no and leave the room real quick. <laughs> Thank you. The motion carries and we will.
recommend this. Yeah. Of course, the board still has to vote on it, so don't be presumptive yet. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Skuvenek, please continue with item number three. Uh, Madam Chair, the second item regards a request for the approval of the establishment of the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Construction Engineering. Um, this is a request for a reorganization of two departments, the Department of Construction Engineering and Engineering Technology to be combined <coughs> with the Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, there are several reasons for this request uh, and a fairly lengthy discussion in the notes, but let me try to summarize some of the relevant points. Um, this reorganization would align uh, construction engineering and engineering technology with a program that has a doctoral program. We believe it would improve advising capacity and student recruitment efforts, and instructional and administrative space will be more efficiently used under this new arrangement. And finally, I think it's relevant to note that there was a recent retirement of the chairperson in construction engineering and engineering technology, and also a change in the chairmanship of the, of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And this uh, merger provides an opportunity to, uh, to uh, hire one chair to oversee those two departments. Thank you, Dr. Skubinek. I really wanted this. I pulled it off of consent because I think we need to remind ourselves that our universities are looking at cost containment, cost effectiveness, and this is a classic example of where they evaluated and realized this was a great outcome. So thank you. Any other questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All those thank in favor you. say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Skubinek. Moving on, I believe Dr. Burke is going to present number four. Regent Neal, we have uh, one request for the appointment with tenure of Kevin Pruitt, who would come in as an associate professor in the School of Medicine's Department of Cell Immunology and Molecular Microbiology. He received his PhD from North Carolina and his postdoc in oncology from Johns Hopkins and currently he's a tenured professor, tenured associate professor at LSU. Uh, Dr. Pruitt is the recent recipient of the Rising Star, which is a Young Investigator Award from CPRIT. It's our first Young Investigator CPRIT Award. It's a $2.4 million uh, grant over five years that the School of Medicine will match with $1.6 million. Great. Any questions or comments? I have a motion to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Once again, we have one of those tricky ones coming up. Yes. Item number five. Recently, almost tenured Mr. Duncan will present the first part of <laughs> number five. <laughs> So goes that he is actually the founding president of the uh, El Paso Texas Tech Health Science Center, and is also the new dean of the Paul L. Foster School of Medicine. Previously, Dr. Lane was vice chairman of medicine and the director of educational programs at the uh, Health Science Center, UT Health Science Center in San Antonio, and he, there he was a tenured professor uh, and uh, at, also at San Antonio and also at John Hopkins Medicine. In Baltimore. He received his BS in biochemistry from the University of North Texas and his uh, medical uh, degree from the University of South uh, Texas Southwestern Medical School. He's a well accomplished uh, and well published researcher and a recipient of nu numerous honors and awards and a cardiologist for all of us. So uh, <laughs> I would uh, highly recommend Dr. Lane uh, for tenure at Texas Health Science Center in El Paso. Can I second that? <laughs> I'd also like to comment that in his brief period of time that he has been in El Paso, he is an absolute breath of fresh air. He's brought leadership to the campus and he has interacted in a manner that is, would make us all proud with the, the El Paso community, 
and I think he is providing leadership not only in the business community but in the in the political community and in the medical community. And he is very well thought of, and he he, he does us very very proud. And it's certainly my honor to have you uh, tenured and part of this uh, organization. Dr. Lang, um, if you can come down a little bit and present the other item. I'm just glad y'all approved. We have no, otherwise. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be in trouble. So thank you very much for those kind words. I'd also like to propose uh, Peter Scott Rotline concurrent with his appointment as the Vice President for Research, the Associate Academic Dean for Research, mm -hmm. the Dean for the Graduate mm -hmm. Regional yeah. Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, yeah. and the Chair for the Department of Biomedical Sciences. He uh, is a uh, his expertise is in internal medicine and endocrinology. He obtained his degrees at Wash U University, where he was a tenured professor after 17 years there, and then moved to Oregon Health Science Center University, where again he was a tenured professor. And you all approved his appointment last time. And he is, again, a, a terrific uh, addition to the Health Science Center and a breath of fresh air. So thanks for approving him last time. I'm recommending the tenure come to his appointment. Thank you, Dr. Lang. Any questions, comments? Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve these appointments. All in favor, please say aye. Those say no. Motion carries. Thank you. Dr. Lang. Yeah. Almost approved. It'll, it'll be approved before the day's over. <laughs> Item number six, uh, Dr. Lang, would you present the revised institutional seal? Yeah. Thank you, guys. It is, it is really an honor to work with you all. I appreciate it. What I've shown here is the uh, current seal at the top of the Texas the Tech University Health know. Science Center. Uh, the, in the middle show. panel, the Texas the Tech University, and it's San Angelo, <coughs> San Angelo State University, excuse me. Um, and uh, what I'd like to propose, oh, we didn't do it. concurrent with the, uh, its appropriation as a separate health science center, in the top left is the presidential seal that was you all kindly approved in August of 2013. And shortly after coming, uh, the uh, faculty, staff wondered whether we could have our own presidential seal. And uh, we went through several iterations. And I'll show you just several proposals. In the top right, for example, you can see that the eagle was changed. The colors are changed a bit. Uh, in the bottom left, the presidential seal has a right-facing eagle. You notice that the current one is a left-facing And the reason why I put that there is I want to be looking towards Lubbock. There you go. When you're in El Paso, <laughs> I don't want to look towards New Mexico, but towards Lubbock. Mexico. And the bottom right is uh, a variation of the current uh, presidential seal. And you'll notice that the, the key features that uh, I think that everybody liked, one was the addition the of the stars. mountains, and the second was the stars. Mm -hmm. And if you've been to El Paso recently, you'll know that it is a city that really uh, encircles a mountain. And the stars represent two things. One is the, there's the star that, that glows at night on the mountain, but also our close association with the military there. With Fort Bliss shown in the bottom left, and the right panel is Jessica Lynch. Remember, she's the only POW, woman POW rescued, 2003 from Iraq. We have a very close association. It's a teaching site for us. And, uh, and even, uh, even Fort Bliss has its own take on El Paso, you are leaving Fort Bliss military residence hasta la vista, right? baby. <laughs> baby. I didn't know that. So what, what we've oh, asked is, uh, is that we would be able to have a revised seal that still maintains the integrity, the heritage, the legacy that we have with Lubbock, but also the uniqueness. Now, I don't want you to think that these were the only seals that we, we offered many different seals, some of which um, past muster, some of which did. There were some that felt that we could characterize El Paso even a little bit more by showing, for example, our recent association with the AAA um, Baseball League. And this was the one that didn't make it to you all. Right there. <laughs> Several key features. Uh, it's a mean so chihuahua. Not, not what we had in mind. So, um, this, this is what the chancellor uh, had, had recommended to us, no, which we're all very pleased at. Again, it has all the features of the, uh, of the seal of the Health Science Center but incorporates the mountain and I'm the stars. The that would way. be the official seal and the black and white seal in the middle and the line seal in the bottom. So we're asking for your approval, uh, for us to have, again, the ties with you all, but again, the, the distinctiveness of being El Paso. 
Is that the, back toward New Mexico again. Yeah, is that the that traditional way. direction <laughs> the, the eagle faces? It's a, it's a traditional way. Okay. This is the traditional way the eagle is facing on the others. Okay. It's a right-handed eagle. <laughs> That's it's right. a right hand. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 I love it. Great. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments from? Nice job. Great. But not the Chihuahua, the yeah, that yeah, one. Make sure that we're approving the right one. All those in favor say aye. aye. <clears throat> Opposed say no. <clears throat> Motion carries. Right, the the official, uh, act in my car with the, with seal. the correct. Right. Well, you were pretty confident, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't make up lapel pins, but he printed some cards, okay? Yeah, these are paper, not paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. I have seven different versions of this. <laughs> he, he got, does he have one with the chihuahua on the back? <laughs> That's the one I want. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the meeting of the Academic, Clinical, and Student Affairs Committee. Thank you, Chairman Neal. We will now uh, recess for lunch. We will reconvene at 1230. All right. I hope everyone had a good lunch and are wide awake. Chancellor, you ready? All right. The meeting of the Board of Regents of Texas Tech University System is now called to order. The board would continue in open session and meet as a committee of the whole in meeting of the board. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the board held on October 7th and 8th, 2014? In August 29th, 2014. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> the motion passes. We will now consider items as a committee of the whole, and I would ask the vice chairman to preside over the committee of the whole. Mr. Andrews. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The item is consideration of the consent agenda items A through C as listed on pages one through, th <laughs> one through three of the agenda book and the information agenda is listed on pages four through six of the agenda book. Before I move on, is there any discussions of any of the items on either of these agendas? As a reminder, if there is an item that you would like discussed in further detail and voted on separately from the consent agenda, you may request that that item be moved to the committee of the whole agenda. Mr. Chairman, I move that the board approve the consent agenda and acknowledge its review of the information agenda. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Mr. Andrews? Mr. Chairman, this concludes the items to be considered by the Committee of the Whole at this time. Thank you. The board will continue meeting in open session to consider reports of the standing committee. Chairman Francis, will you present the items considered for action by the Audit Committee? Mr. Chairman, the Audit Committee of the Board met in open session on Friday, October 10th, 2014, and considered what item as presented on pages A1 through A3 of the agenda book I request the following item be considered and approved, which was a system report on audits. And Mr. Chairman, the Audit Committee also convened an executive session at which time there were no action items uh, considered or approved. Mr. Chairman, the committee recommends approval of the item as presented. I so move. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Please continue. This concludes the report of the Audit Committee. Thank you. Chairman Bonford, will you present the items considered for action by the uh, Facilities Committee? Mr. Chairman, the Facilities Committee of the Board met in open session on Friday, October 10th, 2014, and considered items 1 through 5 as presented on pages F1 through F8 of the agenda book. I request that the following items be considered and approved as a group. Item 1, TTU, approved budget increase for Phase 1, abatement and interior demolition of the Engineering and Materials Research Center building. Item 2, um, TTU, approved project to construct an addition to the Rawls College of Business building. Item 3, TTU, authorized cancellation of a project to renovate a facility. The committee also accepted the following reports. 
um, with regards to the system report on the strategic capital fiscal plan for the system report on facilities planning and construction projects. Mr. Chairman, the committee recommends approval of the items as presented and I so move. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Chairman Monford, please continue. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the report of the facilities committee. Thank you. Chairman Simas, will you present the items considered for action by the Finance and Administration Committee? Certainly. Mr. Chairman, the Finance and Administration Committee of the Board met in open session on Friday, October 10th. 2014 and considered items one and two as presented on FA1 through FA3 of the agenda book. I request the following items be considered and approved as a group. Item number one, TTU approved budget adjustments for the period August 9, 2014 through October 10, 2014. Item two, TTU Health Science Center approved naming of Department of Internal Medicine at Texas Tech University Health Science Center. Mr. Chairman, the committee recommends the approval of the items as presented and I so move. Thank you, Dr. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, please continue. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the report of the Finance and Administration Committee. Thank you. Chairman Neal, will you present the items considered for action by the Academic, Clinical, and Student Affairs Committee? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Academic, Clinical, and Student Affairs Committee of the Board met in open session on Friday, October 10, 2014, and considered items 1 through 6 as presented on pages ACS 1 through 11 in the agenda book. I request that the following items be considered and approved as a group. Item number one, ASU, approve revisions to the admissions requirement at Angelo State University. Item two, Texas Tech, approve appointments with tenure. Item three, Texas Tech, approve the establishment of the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Construction in Engineering. Item four, Health Science Center, Texas Tech University Health Science Center, approve appointment with tenure. Item five, the Health Science Center in El Paso approve appointments with tenure. Item six, El Paso HSC approve a revised institutional seal. Mr. Chairman, the committee recommends approval of the items as presented, and I so move. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Please continue. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the report of the Academic, Clinical, and Student Affairs Committee. Thank you. We will continue meeting as a committee of the whole and meeting of the board. Mr. Locke, please present the schedule of board meetings for 2014 and 2015. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two things to note. The board's next regularly scheduled meeting on December 11 and 12, that Thursday morning, is traditionally when the board conducts a joint meeting with the Investment Advisory Committee and the Foundation Board Executive Committee to, to review investment policies and, and results. So we would anticipate a Thursday morning start for on December 11. Uh, also, at the December meeting, we anticipate being able to um, set a date for the board meeting that would occur one year from now uh, during the fall semester of 2015. We were waiting on one bit of scheduling to be provided to us before the decision is made on when that board meeting might happen. And uh, it may very well be set as a two-day meeting instead of a one-day meeting like this one was. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Chancellor Duncan, please present your report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Regents. Uh, I've been on the job 95 days, I think. I think, but I was a, I was a lawyer, not a mathematician. But uh, it's been a it's been a great 90 days. Uh, I want to reiterate one thing I said last time when I talked to you is that we, we've been I, I've inherited a system that's in really good shape, and I think as you saw by this excellent review that we did on our debt capacity and how that aligns up with our priorities on uh, building, uh, that this 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 system has been managed very well, and you to be congratulated. Uh, for that. Uh, I've had the excellent opportunity to work with four great presidents. Uh, Y'all have done a great job here and I look forward to getting to know them even better. But it, we've, we have uh, all worked together to try to, I think everyone is, has the right uh, attitude about moving this system forward and moving their components and uh, we look forward to bringing you ideas and proposals as we work uh, uh, through, uh, through uh, our, our different priorities, especially in our uh, strategic planning that we'll be doing in February. 
Uh, I will say this from the beginning is that the strategic goals that you set earlier are really good goals and goals that we should be pursuing. And I think what we'll be doing more than anything else is just trying to come up with ways to achieve those goals. So uh, we'll look at that and talk about some of those things, uh, certainly in February and, and later on. Uh, we uh, have presented our legislative appropriations request to the legislature a couple of weeks ago, and that went well. Uh, I was also able to visit um, Washington, D.C., and I was really impressed. We have a program in D.C., and this is uh, Texas Tech University does, and uh, that uh, where we have interns that work in, in all of the different offices or, or in the different uh, legislative offices in Congress. And every time you go into a Texas delegation office, you're going to either see a, a Texas Tech student working there or you're going to see someone who works there permanently from Texas Tech. It's really amazing how strong our, our internship program has been. And they live in a, we have a dorm down there. We call it the Tech House. And it was, we bought them some pizza. They were happy about that. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's probably the only one of any of the universities that do these kind of programs. It's actually within walking distance of the different congressional office buildings. And it's a unique uh, opportunity for these young people to learn about government, but also uh, for us to have persons who are working in government that uh, uh, understand our role and our mission and can be of help to us later down the road. Uh, our fundraising has, uh, has been excellent. Uh, last year, and I think Mr. Cooksey may have reported at our last meeting, but he didn't have the final numbers, but for fiscal year 14, and this is following a campaign, uh, the system raised uh, $158.3 million. And that's significant. Uh, I'm pleased to report to you that uh, we have, uh, as of September, uh, the first month uh, in this uh, fiscal year, uh, we have uh, raised more than $44.3 million. So uh, the, what that tells us, and we're getting close to, we're over a billion dollars in our endowment for the system. We're getting closer to that for TTU and our other systems are growing, or other components are growing in their endowment. What that tells us is, is people now believe in us and they're making investments in the system and that's what we want to see and that's what we want to start moving forward on. Um, the, um, uh, we will continue to do what we're doing, uh, getting around and, and meeting with folks and uh, hopefully uh, uh, when you have a concern or an issue, I would hope that you would call me I would love to hear from you. I enjoy discussing uh, the uh, future and issues with, uh, uh, with you about where we want to go and your vision and to make sure that we're doing what we need to be doing in the chancellor's office and in the components uh, leadership uh, to, to meet your expectations and goals. So I'm going to turn this over now to our presidents because I think they have a lot of exciting news to tell you and I'm Great. real proud Great. to be a part of it. <coughs> Well, to follow up the, the Chancellor, I would agree that it's been a, a wonderful year. This last year, Angelo State University's Office of Development reported that they received a record donations of $13 million last year. Uh, this was more than double of any previous year to that. In 2011, we raised $7 million at that time. And I can tell you that it also included our largest single donation of four and a half million for civil engineering. But I also want to echo what the Chancellor said. We had never reached these kind of levels until we joined the Texas Tech University system. And it was the leadership that we had through the development office, especially through the system and the cooperation we have with, for instance, with Mr. Scott Cooksey and others, has really led Angelo State to a, a level that most regional institutions in this state only look at us in envy. In fact, our athletic conference met just recently and I was elected president of the Lone Star Conference. We received in donations in, there, in that regard more than double of any other institution in our conference. So it, it was because the joining the system and, and, and teaching us the proper way and development and policies and personnel and I give all the credit to the people we have hired in our development office that uh, being able to, to garnish those kind of donations. And we have a great staff and it just works so seamlessly with Chancellor Duncan and the development office here at Tech. 
Hangelo State University has also been awarded recently a $2.87 million grant from the U.S. Department of Education to support the implement, implementation of ASU's proposed new civil engineering program. This grant was awarded under U.S. Department of Education's Developing Hispanic Serving Institutions program in cooperation between ASU and Southwest Junior, Texas Junior College in Uvalde. And it is titled Strengthening, Strengthening the Engineering Pipeline in West Texas. And uh, this program only awaits the final approval of the, of the coordinating board, hopefully this December and February. And, and uh, I also want to mention that uh, recently I met with the coordinating board and their staff on the civil engineering program in order to really uh, answer a lot of questions. They were really surprised that I showed up with Chancellor Duncan. And I want to know, I want you to know that kind of cooperation. I just called to tell him I was going to go. And he doesn't know I'm going to say this. But he asked me, well, you mind if I go along with you? <laughs> I, I want to tell you, that, that kind of leadership is, is really inspiring, not only to me, but the rest of the, the administration at Angelo State. And it made a big difference when we showed up in Austin. All I've got as a report from that meeting is that we did a really good job. <laughs> and so... Uh, I, I was really happy about that. The Angelo State University Master of Science degree in Homeland Security was ranked one of the top 25 by Best Online Masters in Homeland Security Programs by bestschools.org, an e or educational resource that ranks degree <coughs> programs in all disciplines, and ASU ranked 19th overall nationally. Our Masters of Education degree uh, also was one of the top 25 in the nation, and as it was ranked number 12. For the sixth consecutive year, ASU was also designated as a military-friendly school and lists honors in the top 15% of colleges and universities and trade schools that most embrace America's military service members, veteran spouses, and, and students and add to their success on campus. We also had a U.S. Air Force Tech Sergeant Ryan Munoz, an ASU online student from New Jersey in security studies has been awarded one of the 10 Heart of Hero scholarships by the state of New Jersey. He is a resident of Bordentown, New Jersey, and he will receive this scholarship towards his ASU master's degree in security studies. The American Meat Science Association announced that Angelo State has been chosen to host the 69th annual reciprocal meat conference in June of 2016. There's more than 1,000 attendees, a lot of them from Texas Tech can uh, participate in this well as, as well as other agriculture institutions. And it is expected uh, that meat science professionals in academia, government, and industry, as well as all over the country will attend. This is the first time this conference has ever been awarded to a, a regional institution. And I think that uh, says a lot about our food science and meat science programs, both of the PhDs in that program came from Texas Tech, by the way. Dr. Bruce Bechtel, ASU Security Studies faculty, has been awarded a travel grant to the South Korea's Institute of Unification of Education by the government of South Korea. The retired U.S. Marine and former intelligence officer for the Defense Intelligence Agency, Dr. Bechtel, is an internationally known expert in North Korean military, military and uh, political issues and has written four books on North Korea. He has also recently visited by Congressman Thornberry as he is a source for information on North Korean issues and relations for Congress. And finally, I'll just say too that uh, in athletics, we are number two in football, we are number two in volleyball, and we're number one in soccer and ranked number seven in the country in, in girls soccer. So we're having a good fall. Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Jared? Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Mr. Chancellor and honored guests, it is my immense pleasure to be speaking here once again. I am proud to say that for six months, we have still managed not to burn anything down. <laughs> now, I will add a footnote to that, though. We do have our homecoming uh, bonfire tonight. So if y'all got, you guys getting calls for me tonight at about midnight, I need you to just go ahead and assume a few things. One, 
wasn't my fault. <laughs> Two, if it wasn't my fault, it was an accident. And three, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> but all jesting aside, it was recently family day at ASU where the families of students came and enjoyed a weekend of festivities and a great bonding time topped off with a stellar football game. And we have been deeply honored to have had Chancellor Duncan and Chairman Long attend several of our games. Uh, really has reminded us that we really are a family in this system. And we are truly proud and thankful to be a part of it. Notable for mention on the student government side is the SGA fifth quarter initiative. It's uh, something we're piloting for the homecoming game tomorrow night. Um, after the game, we're going to be going over to a local business for bonding, um, celebrating school spirit. We'll have some coaches and some football players dropping by saying a few words. Uh, the goal is to promote school spirit and pride and community bonding. Now this goes hand in hand with our goal to get people more involved with the sporting events as well. And while I personally can't take credit for it, the participation at the games this year has been phenomenal. If you look at the pictures uh, being passed around, you'll see, one, just how packed the stadiums really are, and two, how great the turf is looking. Um, I didn't select these photos, but if you enjoy playing Where's Waldo, you might enjoy Where's Waldo with an ASU twist and find uh, Jared uh, in both pictures. The student government is sponsoring a luncheon with George P. Bush uh, next week. It's in conjunction with the Political Science Department and the Model Organization of American States. We're truly excited to be hosting this event with Mr. Bush. Uh, he has been great to work with and we're uh, really excited to see what he's going to say about leadership and campus involvement. The student discount program uh, continues right on track from where we left off and we're actually projecting uh, a blowout of our original goal by about 35 businesses. The Senate has been working very hard and diligently to make this program a success and uh, they should be commended. We're looking forward to the Texas Tech uh, System Day in Austin this spring. We expect a strong showing from ASU students and alum. It's really, it's really a great time. I got a chance to go my freshman year uh, with the SGA, and I, I learned so much. It was, it was a really great experience, and I'm excited for it. Student Senator Megan Rogers is spearheading an SGA initiative to have street signs around ASU uh, colored with our, school, with our school colors. I'm excited to see her taking this project on. Uh, I believe it is to be important for any school to have something like this around town to really promote uh, school spirit. If you, if you drive around, I guess, UT, you know, heaven forbid, but if you're driving around UT and you, you see their colors, you see A&M's colors at their, uh, their towns. So really excited. Um, I'd also, in closing, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Ross Kushnerite. He's my uh, vice president. He has uh, been an honor to work with him. He's a tremendous VP. He's a geology major, and uh, he works part-time for the USGS, in addition to being VP. And he's also working on an undergraduate research project for ASU. So, thank you. This concludes my report for ASU. Thank you very much. Unless you have any questions, I'm done. Where are you? What's that? Where I am you? in the left. Um, yeah, I'm wearing seven. sunglasses. <laughs> I'm wearing an ASU cape, if you can see me. He's number seven. <laughs> I like the uniforms. Neat. And Chancellor Duncan and I st stood on the sidelines for a couple of games, and I've got the coach, if we're way ahead next time, that he's going to call the play. <laughs> <laughs> could use you tomorrow. <laughs> Dr. Nellis, uh, please uh, uh, present your report. Thank you. After, after Dr. Nellis, uh, Juan Munoz will come forward with, a, with additional reports. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Regents. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you today about uh, some of the highlights in a, in a place that is really a dynamic university as we move forward, and, and you're certainly aware of, of many of these details. But I wanted to start with enrollment, and again, we had the highest, uh, we have highest enrollment in uh, institutional history, the third highest at uh, Texas Tech as far as absolute increase. The largest was 1946, right after World War II. Uh, second highest was 1965 uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, the draft, and, uh, and then uh, this year. So uh, 
If, but, but I think it's looking at the component parts of that enrollment growth that are really important. One is that our graduate enrollment, which is going to help us gain further recognition as a more AAU-like institution, uh, is up 7%. Uh, this figure, 6,500, includes the, the law school, so we're close to 6,000 uh, based on our regular graduate students and then the addition of, uh, of a little over 500 uh, law students. But, but our goal is to, uh, to get to 8,000 graduate students by 2020, and I think we're well on the path uh, to reaching that goal. And that's consistent to try to, to gain a certain proportion of our total enrollment that is graduate-oriented. Retention is up. Again, if we look at AAU-type schools, uh, we need to be up in the high 80s to low 90s, and our goal is to be at 90% by 2020. Um, our year, This year's retention rate, 83, 3.5%, we're up. 1% from last year and almost 3% uh, in the last two years. We want to be a Hispanic serving institution like uh, Angelo State and uh, we're at 22.2% of our undergraduate enrollment right now and uh, this is important as again as we move forward and, and again uh, creates a dynamic uh, national research university presence. International enrollment, low for, for other AEU type schools and this has been a particular focus and you can see that we're up fairly significantly from a year ago and uh, this is a blend of both graduate and undergraduate students uh, and so we're, we're excited about that. Looking at our enrollment scenario and I just wanted to show this one chart here real quick uh, especially the, the top line there about incoming freshmen and we were as you can see that the total number of incoming freshmen 56 a uh, little over 5600 but even looking at that incoming freshman number, and if we were to pull that back a little bit and even raise even more our minimum standards as far as uh, allowing students in, so we, let's say our next class for fall of, of 2015 is 5,100, and we, we look at that kind of holding the line on that rather than continuing to grow that, which has been our past strategy, we can increase the quality, which helps us as far as our national standard, and you can see still that the bubble through, along with our graduate enrollment, this is just undergraduates, but if you look down at the total then of undergraduate students based on our current freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior class, you can see by 2020 we'll be at 32,000. If we add an additional 8,000 in graduate students, um, even withholding this line down, we'll still reach that 40,000 uh, number that we discussed before. Um, research expenditures, which again is a very important part of our national profile. Uh, we're not nearly where we need to be, but we're up significantly. And these numbers will be finalized by the end of October when we have to report these to the coordinating board. But these are fairly close. Our total research expenditures, you can see uh, 154 million, uh, which is up significantly. Research uh, uh, restricted dollars, uh, which is a very important component when you look at National research universities were at almost uh, 47 million. Federal, which has been very low, we're up 10 percent. And this is at a time when a lot of universities are either flat or declining, because as you know, with the federal government budgets at NSF, NIH, those budgets have been fairly limited or, or going down. So we're competing more favorably, which I think is a good sign. Our in <coughs> we've increased our number of propo proposals submitted. But 24% increase in total awards, that's a huge number increase. So that means that I should be able to come to you next year and the year after because many of these are multi-year awards uh, with an increase in our total research numbers and a 13% increase in federal awards. I mentioned the uh, international component and I had the opportunity in, in August uh, to travel to Brazil. Uh, as you know, TTUISD has had a relationship uh, in Brazil for a long time. We have 54 high schools in Brazil that we have a Texas Tech University relationship with uh, and uh, 2,300 students. The tradition has been that these students, they graduate, these are taught by um, American teachers that they recruit down there, some of them from Texas, some from other parts of the United States. They, re they teach these classes, this curriculum in English. Uh, these students, when they graduate, they're selecting places like Harvard and Michigan and Penn State. Why not Texas Tech? And so we actually have the first of these now joining us here at Texas Tech this fall. In fact, I just had them in my office to see how they were doing and they're, they're adjusting very well. And they're already helping us recruit more Brazilian students because they're having such a good experience so far. 
We also had a chance to build relationships with the University of Sao Paulo, the University of uh, the major federal government uh, uh, funding agencies in Brasilia, and the University of Rio. These are some of the, the University of Sao Paulo is one of the top ranked uh, universities in Latin America, maybe the top ranked, and among the lead uh, uh, ranked universities in the world. And we, so having that affiliation certainly helps our profile. Um, I had a chance to visit uh, one of the high schools in uh, Sao Paulo as well as also one in Brasilia and uh, to meet with their administrators as well as the students. The one on the, the picture on the right is of, of this, the current students at this uh, Piedosas uh, High School in uh, Sao Paulo. And uh, again, you can see they put the double T up everywhere. Mm -hmm. You go to these high schools, the double T is everywhere. Our brand, it's just amazing to, to, uh, to see that. And I had a chance to visit with the students and interact with them and discuss the, the program that they have there uh, and, and also reach an agreement with uh, uh, FIPSI, which is a major funding agency for the state of Sao Paulo, uh, where we can collaborate uh, through joint research projects as well. Uh, I'm very proud of the many things we send you and you get briefed on, but our U.S. News and World Re Report rankings, uh, we're up five spots uh, in one year, nine in the last two years. That puts us in the top ten as far as institutions, the delta change the, of increase. The, so we're, we're moving in the right direction, not where I want us to be, but we're moving in the right direction. Military-friendly campus, six years, sixth year in a row. Top 10 school as far as veterans by College Factual. We were number seven in the nation as far as school for veterans. The Rawls College of Business, you already heard from the dean about the number three ranking. And our College of Visual and Performing Arts. We have the only College of Visual and Performing Arts in the state of Texas that has all of its programs fully accredited, and we're very <coughs> proud of that. And we need to keep in mind that Texas Tech is a comprehensive research university. It's not, it's, we certainly have strong science, engineering, business, but we don't want to forget the arts and humanities and how important they are to our overall profile as well. Our research park, you know, we dedicated, they had the groundbreaking for that uh, here recently. Uh, we've appointed a board of directors. Lance Nail will be chairing that. This is a blend of community, university people uh, on the board, uh, they're moving forward. Their first meeting will be later this month, so we can, so we can hit the ground running when that building is complete a, a year from now. A double time is the student component of our innovation and mentoring entrepreneurship program. We have a three-day startup weekend for for student teams to come in. Uh, we're we're looking. We've been speaking with Scott Cooksey about potential for industry naming rights on some of the, the lecture rooms and the research labs and uh, space within the building. And we're already in discussions with potential uh, tenants that can be uh, in that building uh, again when it opens. The new buildings, again, we've already had a lot of discussion about that this morning. Uh, the tuition revenue bond is very important to us as we move <coughs> forward. Uh, HEAF funding, of course, uh, very significant as we do the life safety upgrades, but we also, the former petroleum engineering building, we're, uh, we're retrofitting that. Mechanical engineering space is uh, moving into that area. The former MassCom, again, we're using some of the HEAP funds to do that uh, project that you approved this morning. Uh, but also, HEAP is going to be renegotiated this legislative session, and it's going to be very important, and, and the Chancellor is uh, positioning us, I think, well to, to try to gain some additional HEAP funding long term. Auxiliaries, again, uh, the residence halls renovation is very important, the new residence halls we've, we've already talked about. But I want to also mention that with our fundraising needs, scholarships and endowments, uh, again, uh, that's on the horizon uh, to compete for those top students. If we're going to change the national profile of Texas Tech, we need to be able to secure more national merit scholars, more of those top tier of, uh, of students. And right now, the, even our top scholarship offers are not covering tuition, and we're competing against universities that are providing all their costs. So uh, we need to be able to to be more competitive with scholarships and, of course, keeping our top faculty through endowments. Our College of Engineering, again, uh, uh, with some of the additional renovations in space, they're looking for investments. And keep in mind, too, even though our visual and performing arts are fully accredited, they, if, if you've had a chance to visit their music or theater areas, they're in significant need of uh, additional investment. And, of course, athletics, uh, you're very aware of what's happening with that. So now I'd like to transition to Dr. Juan Munoz uh, to give you a brief overview uh, uh, of some of the things we have already in the, in the development stage or in place uh, from a safety perspective. Uh, Juan, as you know, is uh, chairing our task force on Greek uh, culture, and uh, the chancellor and I charged that uh, committee here this week earlier, 
and uh, we're moving forward on that. So Dr. Munoz. Thank you, President Ellis. Tommy. I wanted to thank you all for uh, allowing us to offer a few remarks on some of our progress and some of our intentions moving forward to create an environment that's safe for all students that attend Texas Tech. So first of all, just some of the programming that we've recently implemented related to assault and other forms of uh, racial, uh, gender-based uh, discrimination. First of all, I want to make the point that Texas Tech has absolutely in place uh, the standard national best practices available and that we do an extraordinary job in providing training to students, faculty, and staff to prevent these kinds of incidences from taking place. In addition to that, we have uh, new online uh, programs uh, uh, such as uh, sexual violence, uh, ttu.edu. Uh, we, we have a policy in place to be consistent with that which has re uh, re uh, enjoyed several uh, significant media attention in the last few weeks in uh, California on affirmative assent, uh, affirmative <coughs> consent policies. Uh, the law was just uh, signed by the governor in California. Uh, we have a step-up bystander intervention training, and many of our staff took place in that training this uh, summer. We have, in addition to that, we have appointed, uh, which it doesn't exist on many other campuses, a dedicated Title IX investigator on our, uh, here at Texas Tech. Uh, Mr. Huffaker put us in contact with the Laura Bush Institute, and uh, we created, for the first time, what we call Sorority 101. We had over 1,000 uh, female uh, Tech students participate in this training where we talk specifically about these issues in an unprecedented way. Sex Signals is an improv a program that we deliver through our Red Raider camp. Uh, Red Raider freshman uh, seminar and uh, wellness curriculum. In our Red Raider uh, seminar, what used to be called the freshman seminar, we have dedicated topics to Title IX and assault prevention, etc. In my own section of Raider Ready, uh, we had an entire uh, class session dedicated to this subject, and, uh, and many of our faculty do that. Uh, we also are implementing new consent education campaigns. <clears throat> But the next steps are just as important as what exists right now in place. Uh, to be compliant with the kind of directive that we're receiving from the D DOJ, uh, as well as uh, the mandate of uh, the, uh, uh, the Violence Against Women's Act. Uh, some of you are familiar with the alcohol EDU training, and we're going to have a counterpart uh, called the Haven training. It's not mandatory yet, but I suspect that there will be conversations about how to make that kind of online training required for students. You know that the alcohol EDU training prevents the students from uh, registering for class until they've completed that training, and we may well pursue that with this Haven training as well. Uh, faculty and staff training on reporting sexual assault and gender-based discrimination through our chair academy. Uh, Dr. Nellis charged us with better training those that are current chairs as well as those that aspire to be department chair, and this will be a topic of their preparation. Develop new resource guides, and we're looking at uh, not just our own existing asset uh, assets related to these kinds of uh, resources, but what we can garner from those schools that are receiving the best positive attention related to this training. Uh, working with our community organizations, uh, we enjoy a very favorable reputation among off-campus entities that work in these subjects and how to strengthen them and how to get their input and buy into our activities. <laughs> Uh, obviously looking not simply at our first, first time, full time freshmen, but looking at our transfer students. Obviously our Greek community, men, sorority 101, parents, alumni, and how to deliver messaging that's consistent to those kinds of constituencies and their priorities. I want to make a few points about sorority life and uh, fraternity life that, because it's uh, obviously received so much attention. We have an unprecedented growth in the community. When Dr. Nellis explains the growth in the university, there's a proportionate growth in our Greek population. It's larger. We have some historical models of behavior and activities that require new approaches to our guidance. New approaches can be uh, uh, always proactive. They can be more directive. They can be more severe. We've got to look at how we provide the kind of guidance and structure for the students involved in Greek life to be successful. Obviously, you've heard about the creation of the task force. Uh, I believe, and based on the feedback that I've received, that there is an unprecedented attention among the Greek community uh, on their behaviors. Uh, uh, increased stakeholder involvement and participation. Uh, part of the charge to our group, that task force from the chancellor, was ensure buy-in. We, we have policies. We have restrictions. They're in place, 
we have to have those subject to those guidance be, feel invested and part of adhering to that guidance. We have to look at our programming toward prevention and leadership development. Another point that the president and the chancellor made in our charge is that there was a time when Greek life was an incubator. The chancellor used the term a laboratory for leadership. We have to return to that time. A combination of new and experienced staff. I have already mentioned our new Title IX investigative officer. We intend to hire more Title IX officers and more dedicated staff to work specifically with Greek life. New reporting and response procedures and a uh, modified organizational conduct. I appreciate that often we think that the increase in reporting uh, is problematic. Uh, I might submit that not reporting when it happens and not knowing about it may be more problematic. We want a climate of disclosure and to investigate. And in many cases, there is substance. And in many cases, there isn't. We want a climate where people feel safe to report when they believe something has transpired and we're going to get there. Uh, we've received, the president and the chancellor have received considerable input from people related to the task force. I'll just uh, submit to this to the board that in addition to the task force and before form, uh, formation of the task force, my team, including, I want to recognize Dr. Amy Murphy, our dean of students, and our associate vice provost, Dr. Kathy Duran, who have done tremendous yeoman work in this area, tremendous work. Uh, but prior to the task force, we had already begun our discussion of our team and the formation of a permanent Greek advisory board, mm -hmm. which will be larger than the task force and will be responsible for implementing, observing, measuring, and modifying many of the recommendations from the task force. And that, that's important because part of the comment the feedback we've received is what happens once the task force sunsets is replaced by a permanent advisory board. Uh, so I also want to provide the, the, the board with a, just a brief summary of our task force meeting that just uh, took place. We received a charge from the president and the chancellor. We provided our task force of 12 members, just a primer on sorority and Greek life. Uh, we provided them with foundational information on on our best practices and preventative measures and, uh, and, and what transpired recently. Uh, we also provided them uh, ideas of what we might discuss moving forward and we provided uh, uh, finally an opportunity for input from the 12 members. And I'll just make this point, it was very interesting how you had 12 members discussing essentially the same to topic uh, with, with using very different vernacular to do so. They had a very different, 12 different perspectives on Greek life, and that's part of the challenge. That's part of the challenge. And so, uh, but we will rise to the challenge, and we will improve. So part of our improvement is, uh, will be the creation of a new, permanent, permanent, fully staffed, preventative education wellness safety office. We've not determined the name, but we've determined its purpose. Uh, we'll have dedicated staff and resources that will provide training within the Greek community and the broader university community. Because while they're members of the Greek community, they're first students at Texas Tech, they're first undergraduates, they're first 19, 18, 17 year old young people developing and hopefully being educated to make good decisions. Uh, student wellness, and I want to make this point as well, student wellness is a critical factor in student success and retention. Student success and retention, and some of that is being lost in this discourse on Greek. These are students, and part of our responsibility is to prepare, educate, and graduate them to be successful, impactful citizens in our state and country, and we'll do that. And so the combination of new resources and programs, existing units with this new office will poise us to respond to current and evolving challenges. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. Are there any questions? Juan, I, I'd like to, I would like to say that in this process, we need to engage the various alumni groups associated with these Greek organizations because they play a large role. And in some cases, these alumni groups, through their clinging to old traditions that today are unacceptable behaviors, or their 
tacitly condoning some of these, uh, we, we've got to engage those groups that provide the leadership to these young people. Right. No, I could agree more. And on the task force, we have alumni advisors. Huh. And uh, just, in, just in, in the spirit of uh, transparency, what we will do at every task force meeting, we will invite one or two outside constituencies to come and share their concerns, priorities. It's been my experience, Regent Francis, in the context of the recent events, that these alumni generally have been shocked at how their group have devolved into this kind of decision making. Uh, they've been very eager to contribute and we'll, we will receive and invite that kind of feedback because as the Chancellor and President have made clear, if we don't have the, in, the input and the buy-in from these groups, we already have policies in place to discourage all of what's taken place and it took place nevertheless. So we've got to do a better job on that front. And we will. Dr. Nellis and the Chancellor have made that clear to me. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you, much. Thanks, Paul. Hey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Board, for having me this afternoon. I'd like to give you a report as it has been quite a while since I've been in front of you. I was at the last meeting in May and quite a lot has happened with the Student Government Association since then. So I'll briefly update you on this. Our graduate Vice President Pradeep Adelari, um, from the get-go had a goal of increasing our research profile at this university in congruence with the Texas Tech Administration. He has make, made great strides to do just that. I'm um, working with Dr. Juan Munoz. He is in the process of recruiting nominees from Texas Tech to attend a Nobel Laureate Conference in Germany. Um, we would like to send a Texas Tech student to Germany with some of the brightest minds in the world and present some of their own research that they've been doing at our school. Um, we're very excited about that. I offered to send Pradeep himself, but he, he declined that. Um, he has also stated that he'd like to lobby for um, international student health care revision and um, educate our current students on their options. Um, you might know that when our international students come, they are mandated into a certain health care plan. And while he realized that is a roadblock, he has held education workshops with our international population to educate them on why that is their option and the costs associated with that to help them have a better understanding. He has also lately been working on a food pantry project, project um, with Dr. Misra in the International Cultural Center, um, another outreach event to help our international students who might be having trouble um, affording their next meal. Bailey Waldrop, our internal vice president, um, wanted from the beginning to create a safer campus environment for our students. Um, she is working on a Safe Trek mobile application that would be um, administered by Texas Tech for all of our students um, to provide constant communication with the Texas Tech Police Department while on campus. Um, our students are always on our phones anyways, and we decided this is a great idea and we're very excited about that. She's also bringing back a senior gift committee, um, a tradition that has been lost in the last couple of years. This committee will meet and fundraise um, throughout the year and provide a senior gift to our campus. We're excited about that as well. She has also successfully brought a class credit for the senators within the Student Government Association, a one-hour seminar class taught by Dr. Juan Munoz um, to provide leadership skills uh, on top of their SGA duties. And we hope to grow that program in the years coming. Stetson Whetstone, our um, external vice president, deals with transportation and parking services on campus, not always the most popular idea around, but we have decided to keep the bus routes the same this year. Um, we had a bit of a funding crisis and we did what we could. The silver lining here is that the buses, while are, they are often changed each year by the student government, are exactly the same as they were last year. So our students came back and had no trouble finding the buses and where they needed to go, which is very helpful and we have received very little complaints. Um, myself, um, I stated to y'all in May that I'd like to see a form of dining bucks um, using our student ID to purchase meals. I wanted to see that go off of campus. And currently there is a request for proposal going out to the public and we are asking for companies to come in and propose how we would do that for our students. And I hope to have this finished um, and ready to go by the spring. We are also um, considering the idea of a dead week. Um, this is an idea to expand our dead day of studies before finals. And we have been working closely with the Academic Council and the Provost's Office to do this. It is going to be a long process that will 
be implemented hopefully long after we're gone, but we think that this is something worthy of doing for our students um, in years to come. We have also had some recent success regarding the academic calendar as well. Um, spring break 2016 has been bumped up a week. Um, this is to coordinate better with other Big 12 universities and other Texas universities. This past year we had a bit of an unfortunate situation where our spring break was a week later than most of our other universities and our friends. Um, this developed problems with families who had kids at different universities and um, as well as students who just wanted to see their friends that one week out of the spring. The Academic Council um, voted unanimously to move that spring break for 2016. Our students are very excited about that. Finally, um, as a note on an issue that you've been hearing a lot about just uh, now from Dr. Munoz, in, co in coordination with Dr. Munoz, the student government plans to um, host an engagement week starting on Monday and going through Friday where we will gather feedback on the campus climate regarding student safety. We will also be promoting the It's On Us campaign. This is initiative, an initiative stemming from the White House um, that in regards to promoting education on sexual assault and promoting bystander intervention. Um, we are going to use the resources that that campaign has um, given to us and gather feedback all of next week on just exactly what the climate is on campus and act accordingly. Thank you very much. Unless there are any questions, I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Mitchell, please present your report. Mr. Chair, I believe everybody should have a we're coming around now. I'm going to try to keep my report as short as possible. Um, on page two, as you get your booklet, we set a record enrollment growth this year, and that's in spite of the, the loss of uh, HSC El Paso. Uh, we had significant growth primarily in nursing, but in several of our areas. We also had a significant growth in the School of Medicine for the first time in many years. So when our official numbers came back, we had 4,500 students, and that's record enrollment for us, even when we did have El Paso as part of the university. So we're uh, very proud of that, and even more proud of what you'll see on page three. The Health Sciences Center now leads the state of Texas in graduating healthcare professionals. We, graduate, uh, we graduated this year 1,768 uh, healthcare professionals from our university. University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston is actually a little bit larger than we are in student enrollment, but they graduated 1,300 students, so for whatever reason, our students can graduate easier than theirs. I'm not sure why that is, uh, but we're, so we're leading the state with that. We, uh, we, as the chancellor mentioned earlier, if you look at page four, we did go down to present our legislative appropriation request to the Legislative Budget Board on September 30th. We tried to keep things pretty simple and pretty focused. Uh, legislative priorities are to make sure that we get the base funding that we've had before, looking at formula funding. Elmo Cavan has, has been a member of the formula funding committee for quite some time. Uh, to maintain our special item funding, we kept our exceptional item requests limited, and I've, I'm going to go over those in just a minute. And then probably the biggest focus for everybody is the TRB, the Tuition Revenue Bond. And uh, from, a, from a base formula funding standpoint, we're trying to get our formula funding back to levels where they were in 2000 and 2001. And, and uh, by doing so, it would be hugely helpful for us. And it's not asking for more than what we're getting paid in the past. We're just trying to get back to what we once had. On page five, if you look at our exceptional items, first there is interprofessional health care education initiative. And what that is, if you look at, at interprofessional education, it's becoming, has been for quite some time, kind of on everybody's radar, but in the last several years, it's become a critical part of the accreditation process for every school we have. And we actually are, are uh, pretty much, well, not pretty much, we're well ahead of the curve uh, compared to a lot of our sister institutions on interprofessional education. And in fact, just a few nights ago, we have one of our professors in the School of Pharmacy, Craig Cox, that has put together an interprofessional education video uh, showing uh, how the, the various schools and professionals can work together in a way, and, and the, the purpose of the video is to give to preceptors as they're teaching our students so they'll know what is expected of them when it comes to interprofessional education. We look to expand our area health education centers uh, to the San Angelo area. This is the program where you target 
uh, students in underserved areas, trying to get them interested in areas of health care. It's been a very, very successful program for us in West Texas, all the way out to El Paso, and so we're looking to move it into the San Angelo area as well. And then our Family Medicine Accelerated Track has been wildly successful for us. The students that we've brought into it are highly, highly, highly motivated. Uh, they are not only highly competent, but when they start, you know, we now have a crew of them that are in family medicine residencies, and uh, they, they outscore their peers on their standardized examinations, and they're doing extremely well. The problem with this is, because we graduate these students after three years, we lose the fourth year formula funding from the state of Texas. So no good deed goes unpunished. So this is one of the things we're trying to point out to them in Austin is that we're doing exactly what the state of Texas needs. We're doing precisely what West Texas needs and we're getting penalized for doing it. With tuition revenue bonds, and I don't wanna go over this too, too much, but I do wanna point out that uh, currently the way that we have been funding buildings has been getting donors to fund buildings. Now, while that moves projects forward, we would far rather have that money to go into endowments and scholarships. And so for us, this is, uh, this is something that we would love to change the way that we're doing the, the, the funding of our buildings. Second part of it for us is that we're starting to bump up against accreditation issues. Uh, if you look at, for example, just our gross anatomy lab, we have the School of Medicine that uses the lab, we have the School of Allied Health Sciences that uses the lab, and we have the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, all that use the gross anatomy lab. And when the LCME, the Liaison Committee on Medical Edu Education, came through uh, this last visit, we're now getting with some of our tanks, the cadaver tanks, where we have up to six students per tank. They prefer that you have four. Now they know that we're, they know what our plans are, uh, but they will not, when they come back in 2017, they are not going to accept having six students at a tank if we don't have something happening uh, to show them that we're moving forward with it. So this isn't just about needing a little more space, this and that. If you look at the health sciences centers, in addition to your SACS accreditation, all the standards you have to hit with that, we have to hit accredita accreditation standards for every single school we have. So there's a separate one for medicine, there's a separate one for nursing, there's a separate one for allied, uh, for allied health sciences and their fields, a separate one for pharmacy. So you've got to make sure that you're hitting all the accreditation standards for all of the folks that are, that are in charge. And this is a critical thing for us. It's not just, won't it be nice if we can get some money from the state? This is a real critical thing for us uh, moving forward. And so, um, so we really have, we're trying to make, make the, the point to the folks in, uh, in Austin that this is, this is for us, this is very, very, very important on the timing standpoint. If you'll jump over to page seven, I don't wanna be uh, belaboring a lot of things about all of our schools. <coughs> As our enrollment growth has grown, so has our academic standard for everything that we're doing. And I just use as an illustration School of Medicine. Our MCAT scores have picked up and picked up and picked up over the last several years from recruiting efforts. We are now sitting where we want to sit. Uh, we don't need to have our MCAT scores going up any higher than they are. And on the bottom of page seven there, I have a little graph, and it shows that what the MCAT scores were for 2013 of all takers. So there's about 94,000, 95,000 people that took the MCAT uh, in 2013. Now, uh, some of these are repeat takers. If you take the MCAT and you score extremely low, you don't bother. You could try to go, you know, work at a shoe store or something. If you, if you take the MCAT and you score extremely high, you don't worry about it either. But there's that big mass of people right in the middle that, that do pretty good on it, and they keep taking it and keep taking it, trying to pick it up. So you had 95,000 people, or 95,000 tests that were taken, but you had about 44,000 people that applied to medical school from that. And if you look at the average uh, score uh, that I've marked there with the yellow line, it's uh, about 25 is the average score on, on all these tests from 2013. Uh, if you look at where we are there, we're sitting between that 31 and 32. So we're sitting in a beautiful place with, with our MCAT. So moving forward, we're not going to be trying to uh, continue to push that thing up higher than we are. Um, on page 8, very quickly, one of the things that the Association of American Medical Colleges puts out, they have what they call a faculty forward survey that they do uh, periodically looking at the, the satisfaction of your faculty. And I just want to put in there, I just want to put this in there to illustrate to you guys that, you know, we have, we scored beautifully as far as faculty satisfaction relative to not only our peer group, but to all medical schools in the country. 82% of our faculty members uh, were either satisfied or very satisfied compared to 
from peer group standpoint, 68% of faculty who were satisfied are very satisfied and co compared nationally to 65% of faculty members in medical schools. We do an extremely good job of trying to make sure that we engage our faculty where we can, uh, have them as part of the process of what we're doing, and they work in an environment that is, that is just uh, phenomenal because we've got good things happening. Uh, on page nine, I just have a little, I've got an article in here about the uh, combat center. We've had a significant expansion on our School of Nursing Combat Center. The chancellor is going to be going out there with me in a few weeks uh, to, to tour the area. But keep in mind, this is a, this is a clinic that serves about 5,000 folks in Lubbock every year run by our School of Nursing. It's a wonderful program. If you'll skip on over to page 12, one of the things that we've done since Michael Kahn, who is our vice president for research, one of the things that, that he's been doing since he joined us is to go through and systematically review everything about research that we're doing. Look at the various labs, look at things that we can do for advanced accreditation, look to areas where we may have inconsistencies in the way we're doing things, and really put some uniformity to the approach that we have with this. He's done an extremely good job with this, and our, uh, our, by doing it like this, by making sure that our facilities are what they need to be, by making sure that our protocols are what they need to be, so that we get everybody playing by the same rules with this, we're laying the foundation for things for our, for the, for our university to then start pushing forward more on the efforts for our research. Uh, on page 13, I just illustrate there what our, what our current funding is looking like for NIH and other, other federal funding. One of the things that, um, I didn't come out on the, on the page here, but one of the areas that, that if you look at the, the, the green area there, if you look at uh, uh, non-federal funding, secret funding and the like, that's an area where everybody's trying to pick things up. And then the last couple of things I have there, Mommy Meds is that app that I've talked about on your phone where you can, if you're a pregnant mom or a breastfeeding mom, you can just take photographs of the barcode and it'll tell you whether or not you can be using the medication. Uh, the Laura Bush Institute had their National Advisory Board meeting yesterday, and uh, hopefully we're going to be able to get a, a national launch of this uh, on something like the Today Show. But we've already had some national attention from this in West Virginia, uh, where apparently people really want to know about breast milk and drugs. Uh, on page 15, it didn't print off here, it says Witter Project, but that's actually Twitter Project. This is a, an extremely, an extremely innovative program using telemedicine in adolescents that are at risk for violence. And, and we were called specifically by the governor to think through some of, the, some, some of this type of thing after the, the Newtown shootings. And the idea was, can we put together some type of program where we can identify kids that are at risk and get them the help they need before they become ticking time bombs? Dr. Billy Phillips, who's the Executive Vice President for Rural and Community Health, put together this program. We looked at three large school districts. We went through and had a team that would uh, train everybody in the school, from the principal down to the janitor, about certain specific signs of aggressive behavior, uh, 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 problematic behavior psychologically. So the, the, the fact, the, the, the staff and the, uh, all the, the teachers were trained in this. But then we put in place a system whereby the, the kids could get counseling at the school level and when, when that was not enough, they could then drop back and get counseling through LPCs that we have. If that was not enough, they could be, get referred back for psychiatry that we were providing for adolescent psychiatry. There are only a handful, I think the number is like 18 or something like that, 18 adolescent psychiatrists in all of West Texas. And so using telemedicine where they could Skype, they could then talk to these kids. They screened a total of over 8,000 students and from them, there were about uh, 300 students that were needing referral in. Most of them were just needing some counseling. But we did wind up finding a handful of students that were uh, really, really, really at the edge of things. And in fact, one student was contemplating suicide. Another student was contemplating homicide and had done things to prep themselves in, in, all, along the way. So the, we presented this to the governor a few weeks ago on a visit that he had out here. He's very excited about the preliminary findings, and this is all being written up in a way that can be published also in, in, for research. Uh, but we're gonna expand the program to other areas around the state, and we're really excited about that. International Programs Week is this week for the Health Sciences Center, and this is something that uh, we always, uh, we're really working to expand our international programs, and in fact, we're trying to do things where we work more with 
uh, the other schools that are also uh, involved in international health programs because it makes sense to try to join efforts. A lot of times, even with between Texas Tech and the Health Sciences Center, uh, they'll be doing things internationally that, that we're not knowing about and, and vice versa, and we can get some cross collaboration. It'd be great. In fact, when Nellis told me he was speaking for Brazilians, I thought that just meant somebody's going to pay him a lot of money to go talk to him. But <laughs> I found out otherwise. Uh, I put on the last page there, page 17, are some of the photographs that some of our students have taken working in various areas, uh, specifically uh, down in Central America and Nicaragua. So it's end of my report if you have any questions. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm really excited to tell you about all the great things our students and our Student Government Association have been doing this semester. We've been extremely busy, but um, I feel like we've been very successful thus far. Um, so last Saturday, we had one of our students' favorite events of the year, I think. It's the annual TTU HSC Masquerade Promenade. And this is, um, it's a great event. We invite all of the students in the school to come, you know, dress in your finest suits and tuxedos and just take a night off from studying and, you know, interact with each other, talk to nursing students if you're med students. And uh, we had about 250 students attend. It was held at the Louise Hopkins Underwood Center for the Arts. Um, really nice venue. We had a great meal. Everyone had a good time. We had a DJ. There was dancing afterwards. And I think it was a great success. Um, we've gotten rave reviews, so we're looking forward to continuing this legacy in years to come. Um, our next big event that's coming up is another one of our favorites. And this one has been really great for me to see just grow over the years. So this is my third year involved in the Student Government Association, and my first year, this leadership summit was about 20 people in a, in a lecture hall talking about problems with the university, and it was primarily loving students. Last year, we ramped this up, um, you know, fivefold. We had almost 100 students attend, and we had students from as far as El Paso come, and we gave them all football tickets to the game. We had this huge tailgate that was professionally catered, and everybody, again, just had a blast. We had our survey cards. We got fives across the board on it. So it was fantastic. And we're looking forward to continued growth. We've already got students from Abilene, Amarillo, Odessa, Dallas, El Paso, RSVPing to our event. So we think it's going to be even bigger. And we're expecting probably between 100 and 120 students to come. And again, we're doing a tailgate. It's going to be on November 1st. So we're providing tickets to the UT game. And I hope that's not the only reason that people are traveling to the event. but. Regardless, it's going to be a huge success. We're currently working on getting some distinguished speakers to come um, talk. We're going to have an interdisciplinary team building activity where we'll have med students and nursing students doing like scavenger hunts and stuffing teddy bears, which will donate to the Lubbock Children's Home. So it's also going to be a service activity. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be a huge success. So I look forward to updating you guys at the next meeting on uh, how, how good it is. Um, another thing we've been working on is, uh, as you probably saw on President Mitchell's slide, the Your Life, Our Purpose. That's this big campaign that's going on at TTUHSC right now. We're trying to get more community engagement and things like that. And we're also working on a student angle of this. And so we're talking with the um, Office of Development and Planning right now of doing a student philanthropy campaign <laughs> where we'll ask our students to voluntarily donate a small amount of money, something like $200 a year. And this money will all go into a pot, which is then going to be given back to the students in the form of scholarships. And so we hope to be able to eventually endow this scholarship and give more money and make it bigger and better. And this, is, this model has proven successful. It's several other universities. I think, I believe it's the Boston Business College has 100% um, enrollment in the program, and it seems to work great. So we're, we're really looking forward to this. Um, so upcoming in October, we're going to have our senators working at the TTUHSC Employee Health um, Fair. And so they're going to be doing things like checking heights, weights, blood glucose, doing BMIs, just to kind of promote um, you know, healthy lifestyles at TTUHSC. And it's a great opportunity. All the faculty and staff are invited to come. Um, it's, it's a really good um, engagement. And it, it hasn't been all fun. I've got to tell you, I've been putting my, my senators to work. We've already got several volunteer activities going. Um, we're having them work at the pumpkin trail, so they're going to be carving pumpkins, lighting pumpkins. 
Um, and then we're also going to be having them uh, provide food and cook meals at the Ronald McDonald House, which is a really great opportunity, you know, just to give back to the, the tenants there. Um, and we have lots of other activities. Like I told you before, last year we had over 1,000 hours of community service in the 50 senators, and we're going to keep growing that. So um, it's going to be really successful. So a few other things we've done. Wireless printing is active in the HSC. I know it took us like eight months to get this going, but it's, it works. Our students love it. Um, they love having that available. Also, classrooms are now available to be reserved by students as study spaces 24-7, which again, it's been immensely popular, and it's one of the big complaints we've been having. Um, so we're also currently working on a big fundraising drive for the TTU HSC SGA, and the money's going to be split between our operating budget, so we continue to have these big, you know, healthcare conferences that are growing, and this and that, and we're also going to be donating some of the money to our Double T scholarship with the hopes of one day being able to endow that one as well, so we can give more scholarships and bigger scholarships and hopefully look more attractive to prospective students. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is our future healthcare providers conference. And again, this is one of those activities that I've just loved to see grow. I mean, my first year here, it was entirely med, med school. So in this event, um, we had just community members come, you know, high school and middle schoolers come to this event and we just told them about med school and what they need to do and what it's going to entail. And then my second year here, we were like, you know what, we should, we should open this up to all the schools here. So we got all five schools involved and we got something like 200, 300 students to come and it was great. And uh, so this year is going to be even bigger and better. We've already got in touch with the Army um, healthcare people and they're going to be setting up a triage tent um, outside of our academic classroom building. So they'll be kind of demonstrating uh, what, what you know, Army triage is like. And so we're expecting, you know, 30 vendors. We'll probably get 300, 350 community members out there. It's a great opportunity, you know, just to kind of tell people what we do. And it's not just medical. So nursing can tell, you know, what going to nursing school entails and the allied health and their um, several programs. So um, it's going to be a great event. Um, and that's, that's all I've got for you. If there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Otherwise, all right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board. It's a pleasure to present and tell you a little bit about what's going on in El Paso right now. Uh, the Office of Institutional Advancement, we've hired uh, four people since I've come on board, and I give a lot of credit to Scott Cooksey and Kendra Burris for helping to identify this individual. Victoria Pineda is the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Institutional Advancement. She is a certified fundraising executive. She received an undergraduate degree in organizational communications and a master's degree in public affairs and cultural studies. She has over 10 years of fundraising experience and was uh, head of the director of development for the College of Sciences at UTEP. And she got disenfranchised with the organization when they asked her to, to, uh, to uh, not be so successful. She was raising more money than the other directors and asked her if she could tamp it down a bit, and I said, I want you, and uh, she joined us. Uh, subsequently, Olivia Zapata, Development Officer, Jennifer Venegas, Director of Grants Development, and Susanna Contreras has also joined us. So I look forward to what they'll be doing. Uh, over the last three months, uh, just to let you know that we've gained over $4 million additional research funds uh, from CPRIT and from the NIH and R01. The first two are remarkable, because that's from a family practice physician. So this is a group that Dr. Shokar is a family practice person, and she mentored Dr. Maloqui. And so this is a succession planning at its best. So an additional $4 million in research. Uh, since I last spoke with you, about 25 of the physicians in El Paso, despite its youth as a health science center, have been selected by their peers. This is a peer-selected designation of best physicians in America. I want to particularly highlight the family medicine program, where a large number of those physicians come from. Well, one of the things that we're tasked to do is to increase primary care physician um, accessibility in Texas, and in particular in our area as well. And we have one of the best family medicine programs around the country. Uh, we were pleased to host the Texas Tech versus UTEP game. You can see the back of the shirts that we distributed, 3,000 t-shirts that said, your turf is mine. We're pleased to have the Chancellor join us and uh, Dr. Nellis to join us as well. Uh, but the bottom left is me wearing a reflective 
uh, jacket. Uh, that's my wife said it's the only way I could appear bright was to wear that. <laughs> and uh, and then Cliff Kingsbury at the bottom because all the women who took all these pictures said I couldn't possibly present that was having a picture of Cliff in there somewhere. Okay. I'm happy to report that the Gail Grieve Hunt School of Nursing is on budget and on time. These are uh, latest pictures as they're about to pour concrete out front. Uh, when I first interviewed or first visited El Paso, the building was green. It was just all insulation. So all of this has really come up over the last several months. Um, I want to again acknowledge what uh, Regent Monfort has done in terms of making sure that all of our buildings are accompanied by public art as well. This is the public art that is between our two buildings, the medical education building and medical science building. It really is gorgeous. I want you to look at the floor for a second. You'll notice this interlacing pattern. It looks like a DNA helix. And uh, the individuals in charge of public art at the Gail Greve School of Nursing, Gail Greve being one and the other being Ginger Francis, have chose, chosen a beautiful design selected from uh, a number of uh, different uh, possibilities. This is actually, it's a lighted public art sculpture that will be organized in that same motif, kind of a DNA motif. It serves, serves several purposes. One is obviously it's a beautiful art. Second is publicly enjoyed. Three is it improves the safety on our campus as well, because this is an area, as you uh, recall, is not particularly the best area of town. This will be lighted the entire night as our nursing students go in and out of the building. Uh, it's really quite spectacular. And again, I want to thank Regent Monfort and Ginger Francis for helping us with this. You all got notice that our that our um, attendance or enrollment has increased about 17 percent. We now have over 500 students from 40 in 2009 to over 500 students. And we've done that, by the way, without increasing uh, additional faculty. Over the next several years, we're going to increase the number of residents. We'll be adding residency spots at uh, our partner uh, hospitals, tenant hospitals, adding 12 to 16 slots over the next several months in neurology and another 70 to 75 slots and other basic core. And that's, gonna, that's important because if we train medical students and don't have a place for them to practice, and that is to, to do their GME or their residency, they go elsewhere. We pay for their education here, they go elsewhere to receive the residency and they oftentimes stay there. We know that our experience in El Paso is that if you come to do your residency in El Paso, 40% of those individuals stay in the state of Texas, 23% of them stay in El Paso, and 5% stay on my faculty. Uh, this is a, just a, uh, to remind you that over the course of the next several years, we'll be, we will be transitioning, although we are, quote, a free, <laughs> freestanding health science center, we still maintain very close ties with our sister institution in Lubbock. And we will be accredited, our sex accreditation will occur as a joint institution in 2017. But over that time, there's a very methodic transition that occurs involving research and budget and business affairs, institutional research, shared central services, physical plant, human resources, and on a monthly basis, Ted, Ted has his associate's deans come together. They meet with my associate deans to make sure that the transition is, is uh, going appropriately. I can't thank you enough for providing me with an excellent partner. Ted and the group here is just outstanding and have been a tremendous uh, enjoyment. It's been a tremendous satisfaction to work with them. I really enjoy it. Again, that's Ted. <laughs> that's us. Part of Ted. Now, I'm going to turn over to our student, but I, I just want to say, uh, Jeremy, I know this is your first time here, and one of the advantages of being here is you <laughs> learn from the other student representatives. And Hayden introduced something that they do in Texas Tech University, which we can't do. They have dead week. We can't do that at Health Science Center. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, please. <laughs> Jeremy, please. <laughs> Jeremy, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, uh, Chancellor, Dr. Lang. Um, one of my first things I'd like to do is uh, get that dead week. Um, so um, so um, I first of all, I want to thank everyone uh, for this is the first time for us to be able to do this report. And you really rolled out the welcome mat for me. It made me feel really welcome. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about, um, if you could go to the next slide, um, the Student run clinic is kind of our, one of our proudest things that we have going on right now that our students, it was student, it was student idea, student, um, they run it completely on their own. Um, of course we have help from the office of the dean and um, we've gotten these grants. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read this slide for you. Oh, sorry. Um, over $20,000 from Susan G. Komen grant award and uh, we've done some breast cancer screening, uh, 18 to date. 
$5,000 from the Stern Foundation Charitable Fund for uh, the clinic operation costs. Um, and um, we've had some presentations, the Society for Student-Run Free Clinics in Nashville, and feature story in the Texas Bar Hispanic issue section. Uh, best oral presentation at Paul Foster School of Medicine Service Learning Symposium. Um, their uh, presentation title was Don't Take No for an Answer, Starting a Medical School, Medical Student-Run Free Clinic on a Short Timeline, a Community Approach. Um, they also got some awards, a uh, CDC 2014 Excellence in Public Health Award from the U.S. Public Health Service Physician Professional Advisory Committee. And they were also the uh, Chili Cook-Off winners uh, last year, and we'll see if that happens again next year. Um, and as to date, they've had cl 19 clinic sessions, uh, and they're usually staffed by four to five uh, faculty, um, and 295 medical student volunteers, and um, 403 patients have seen. And um, I can personally say I've, I've volunteered there before, and it's just after you leave there, you, you're, you're reminded why, why we got into medicine, why we want to do this. And you see people the next day after, you know, you didn't go, but you see someone else, and they're, they're bright, they're, they're real spry, they're ready to study again, and it, it's, a good, um, it's a good refresher. Um, and so um, we have some fundraising for the uh, community center that it actually is run in. Um, this Sunday, actually, um, we have a sprint for Sparks, and um, our great service chair, Emily Collins, has done an amazing job at organizing this and getting this together. Um, and um, all the other service reps, and it, it should be a good time. We're going to have some booths and some things for uh, people to do. Um, and then also in the spring, um, we're planning a golf tournament, which I hope that um, this is an open invitation to you all right now. If uh, you want to dust off your clubs and come out to make a visit to El Paso and run by the clinic and see what it's all about and see how it's run. Um, so Augusta actually uh, approached us and they're like, we want you to have our golf your golf tournament here. And <laughs> we decided to stay local, so uh, we're still trying to figure out a venue, but uh, we had to cross Augusta off the list. Uh, we might have low participation for that. But, um, and then I also want to talk about student life a little bit. Um, so we have this thing called College Cup, and um, our school is split up into four different colleges, and uh, you may already know this, um, but... Uh, it's kind of, we have a Hogwarts-style competition where everybody gets points, and you get points for volunteering, and then we have these competitions. And a few weeks ago, we had a field day event where we had a uh, tug-of-war, a kickball, um, we had an egg drop, and we had, um, and we had a relay race. And it, it was a blast. And last year, in the community service aspect of it, we had over 1,000 hours of volunteer hours. So that was a big accomplishment for a, a pretty small school. And um, we also, you know, we have time for extracurricular activities. Uh, on the right there, you'll see um, about 20, 25 of us all crammed into a place that, that houses 20. Um, we went to Santa Fe to go skiing, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, I, I think it's gonna be an annual tradition with our students, and it's, everyone gets really excited about it. And uh, that was a successful trip, minus uh, me losing the battle with my leg and a rock. It did not went end well. Um, and then we also have a, a lot of interest groups right now, and I'm, every day you get a, there's a new interest group. Um, I got one this morning for the Geriatric Society, and there's more and more coming about, and people are getting really excited about finding what they want to do in medicine. And it's been, it's, it's growing rapidly. Um, and last year we began the, uh, our first intramurals. Uh, if you'll see there, that's the first soccer championship, and you see the, the scruffy looking guy with the black hat, that's, uh, that's me, we won. Um, we had help from a professional soccer player to, who's to my left there. Um, we try to get basketball going, but we don't have a gym facility. We try to get it set up with U UTEP, and um, that uh, it kind of fell through. That we got it set up, and um, it just didn't it just didn't pan out for that particular year. But I think we'll be able to get it going here. Um, and um, so I just want to talk about a couple um, issues facing our students right now. Um, recently, uh, the first two year our first year and second year students uh, were able to park on campus, and um, due to some um, unforeseen circumstances, we were moved off campus and now we shuttle to and from a, a remote parking lot, which is only about five minutes away, but um, one of the concerns we have with that is it's not in the safest part of town, and so it's a big safety concern when people are, you know, coming in early in the morning um, to this parking lot and then having to shuttle, they have to wait for the shuttle, and it's across the street from a homeless shelter, and it's, it can be concerning, um, and people are actually choosing to park on streets that are not our property, so it's, it's, it be, has become a safety concern. And it's also a little inconvenient, uh, which is you know, not our biggest concern, but it, it, with a variable medical student schedule, it, it is a little bit problematic for us. 
Um, and also our student activities and wellness center is, uh, we, you know, we're a growing school and so we're going to need to um, kind of look into uh, growing our exercise facilities and, you know, I, this may be in the future plans and I'm, I may be um, going over something you've already gone over, but um, right now our exercise facilities aren't, aren't um, you know, we could do better, I feel like, and um, a gym would be amazing. Uh, we could do our college cup events there. Uh, we don't have, we have to, right now we have to compete with the city for a lot of, a lot of events, and there's a lot of community-sponsored um, things that, that we have to compete with. So we'd like to not have to do that, have our own place where students can call home and they can play basketball. They actually played basketball before class at 9.30 this morning. They play every week, and it would be great for them just to be able to walk across, go to class, and then go back and play some more and get some exercise in and help them with their studying. Uh, the last uh, issue is uh, access to research. Um, so currently we have a required research project which I think is great for our school and we really want to um, get our school on the map and so um, increasing the access to research maybe by encouraging faculty or um, whatever we have to do, um, we would really like that. This summer I went over to UT Southwestern and did some urology research and it was great and I just wish I could have stayed in El Paso to do that because that would be, that would be amazing um, and it would you know, get us more time in the city and we'd get, make those mentorships, connections with different faculty. Um, and as far as plans go for our students, um, we're, um, you know, we're our own um, institution now, so we'd like to integrate with uh, the Gail Grieve Hunt School of Nursing and the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences and get our SGAs together. And so uh, we're going to try, we're in a, the process of, you know, whether we need a center or whether we need a council or what we need to do to get that that streamline so we can all work together, have socials together, get to know each other, not compete for study rooms and be friendly and, and you know, work on our interprofessional communication skills. And, um, and lastly, um, I want to thank whoever was responsible for um, selecting Dr. Lang. Uh, everyone's really, really excited to have him as our president. He, um, he made a really big splash when he, when he came here. He, um, a few people were studying on Saturday nights, as a lot of med students do, instead of going to the bars, they're in the libraries, uh, heads in a book, not in a drink. And um, Dr. Lang uh, showed up and bought everybody barbecue, and that just, it blew everyone out of the water. He's, he's, and we're really, really thankful that he's with us. So, um, and, and unless you have any questions, that concludes uh, my report. Very good. Very good. Good job, Jeremy. Right, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. The board will now convene in the executive session as authorized by section 551.071, 551.072, 551.074, code. The board will move to the mass rider room for executive session. Let's do the board will now convene into open session. Mr. Andrews, please present the motions regarding the items discussed in executive session. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is one action item resulting from executive session today. Mr. Chairman, I move the board authorize President May to conclude negotiations with the San Angelo Coats Base Baseball Club LLC debtor in Chapter 11 bankruptcy and a potential donor for terms of the stadium, usage, and naming rights under the terms and conditions set forth in executive session. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Continue, please. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the uh, items out of executive session today. Okay. Uh, the final item of business uh, is announcements. Uh, there are no announcements that I'm aware of, so uh, uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn the meeting? The meeting of the Board of Regents, Texas Tech University system, stands adjourned. We got through it. Outlasted our